<clears throat> okay. So now I think we're actually live. Uh, we just went through everyone's introduction um, and realized that I was not broadcasting. Uh, I apologize for that. One of these days I'll learn what I'm doing, but I wouldn't hold your breath, honestly. Uh, well, anyways, welcome to session 20 of Beneath the Banner Shadow. Uh, this one is called Of Faith and Fate. Of Faith or Fate. Um, I'm very excited to see how the things that I have planned this evening are going to pan out for our five heroes. We did just do our introductions, so I'm just going to skip over those for now. Everyone had such beautiful words to say. I, I do apologize. Um, basically, things are bad right now. Treat each other well. Do, do the right thing. Uh, wash your hands. Wear a mask. Stay home. Be nice to each other. Help when you can. Be compassionate. Show empathy. Build up the people around you instead of tearing them down. That's what we all need to be doing. All right. Just so, do the right thing. Do the right thing. The good or at thing. least don't do the wrong thing. If you can't bring yourself to do the right thing, Stop doing the wrong things. If you ever in doubt, just think. Think, what would Tord do? What would Tord do? WWTD. WWTD. <laughs> in fairness, uh, Tord started a bar fight and we murdered a bunch of people. So maybe take that with a grain of salt. Did we murder them? Think what Tord would do and then maybe do the opposite. I had a cold that day. I did murder them. Yes. It's all true. We have it on camera. Um, so yeah, uh, the other point of things, point of things, the other thing that I wanted to touch upon uh, that we did go over is that this is session twenty. We are going to be celebrating our two-year anniversary at the end of next month. I'm very excited to reach that milestone, and I can't wait to see what the next twenty. <laughs> will hold for us who knows uh okay so uh once again thank you to rachel uh for doing the shield designs i do want to make sure that i get that in if uh language and subject matter of the mature variety or something that is a problem for you then take your pearls and leave I'm looking at you mabel all right so unless there are any questions then we can go ahead and finally really actually get started can we, can we start? Can we start now? Can we play now? Yes, Tord. Yes. Okay. Here we go. There are two versions of us all in this world. One is who everyone else perceives us to be, comprised of our past actions and the expectations of what we will become. The other is who we perceive ourselves to be, built of what we have accomplished and what we dream to achieve. The ideas surrounding these two versions will undoubtedly affect one another, possibly even altering one in favor of the other. The key to this dual existence, as in all things, is balance. We rejoin the five of you fresh off of your skirmish with Agaric the Red Cap in the the lower levels of the Crypts of Galalon, this kind of sacred place where heroes and kings and queens and high-ranking clergy are laid to rest. Where you discovered a foul ritual, a black magic ritual that had been enacted in the tomb of Garfran Pendrake, After destroying this, this shrine, you were set upon by this creature in disguise, Agaric the Red Cap. And you have fought 
and killed him. So now you have two bodies. That of the twisted, uh, diminutive red cap. And that of a humanoid guard who is pretty much kind of a spore puddle um, in clothes at the moment. So, what would you like to do? I think we had better get somebody down here. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, if it's okay, maybe uh, some of us should look for the man he was impersonating. Because it's likely he's dead in here somewhere, too. I can go. I can. I can see in the dark. Agreed. I'll come with you, Dan. All right. I would say I will go tell someone, but I don't know if I should go alone. Yes, maybe. Uh, Edward, maybe it's better that you go. Yes, I suppose you're probably right. I'd be more than happy to accompany you. <laughs> Let's make our way up. Okay, so it sounds like Eddard is going up to just summon a guard. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get the attention of the first, you know, first guard to um, basically just let them know that, you know, something's going on. Uh, there, there's been a murder. Sounds like it. Um, okay, so it doesn't take you long. You kind of head up uh, the last level, maybe two, to get back to the, the large eight doors that you took in order to to get down here and there were two armed guards immediately outside of those doors um, so you're able to run up and get their attention and um, draw some attendants to come basically see what's going on um, and hear your story very good Tord and Dane you guys are <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you guys are headed deeper, um, just kind of into the hallways and stuff of the crypts to just kind of search for this body. Okay. Um, roll me an investigation. Or one of you can roll with advantage, either way. Dane, go ahead and roll with advantage, because investigation is not. Thing. <laughs> I don't so much do that. Uh, yeah, being smart's not my thing either. Uh, fourteen. All right. Um, so it's it takes a while, um, and you guys can can hear a lot of the conversation and stuff that is happening, uh, back where you fought, Agaric. You can tell that the the guards have have made their way down here. Um, and it takes you another few minutes past that point before you finally come around a corner um, and find a a, bar, a a guard that's wearing the same livery and things uh, that the, the guards for the crypt wear. But this person is a, a husk, like, like dried up, mummified almost. Uh, but the clothes do not look very old. Well, it's probably improper for him to stay down here. <clears throat> well, I suppose we should uh, take him back. 
Don't worry, I, I got it. I'm not. I'm not worried about the dead body. I'm more worried about if there's more of those mushroom things. Do we have an approximate knowledge of how many guards were potentially around here? I know we were aware of our guide. So, typically here, they only keep a guard per level. Like, outside? Well, they have a guard inside, but it's, like, one guard per level, and that's it. And there's, like, four levels. Okay. So, there's not very many here. It's a pretty casual kind of detail. They don't typically run across very much uh, activity. How many floors down were we? You guys would have been on the fourth floor, all the way at the bottom. Okay. And this body that we're finding is on the fourth floor. Uh, no, it's probably back up on the third. Okay. I'm just trying to get a, an approximation of how many people would be applicable for more than one red cap. Well, seems rather lightly watched down here, as there presumably wouldn't be much going on. Not a bad idea to look out for anyone acting. <clears throat> Suspicious. Do you think we can touch him and not? Uh... Look, I know everyone yells at me about black magic, but I don't actually do it. I'll pick him up. Don't worry about it. And I'm going to scoop him up. <sighs> you know, this isn't. Uh... This isn't right, like naturally, or. I can tell you one thing, this is gonna make us look real bad. <sighs> Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, that, that seems to be a, a trend everywhere we go. We usually just look real bad. Lord, are there any orcish fairy tales where all the heroes are horrible until the last minute? Because uh... no, most of them are pretty glorious acts of bravery, acts of community. We usually don't tell the stories of the assholes unless they're getting beat up. We got the bravery part down, but we should probably start working on this whole uh, community thing. Yeah. We're doing our best, I think. I think we maybe there'll be times that we need to try harder. Maybe the idea of reforming the the sword isn't just about a a piece of metal, but about the ideal, the the meaning behind it. And right now, we're much more like a a muckrake, a vikerel, than a sword. Sometimes. I think. Perhaps we've been thinking of the sword as a weapon this whole time when it's really more of a symbol, is what you're saying? Yeah, I, I don't doubt that there's a sword. I don't doubt that we'll have to find it, but... Doesn't it come down to who's using it? I really hope it's not me. That's a lot of responsibility toward her dang, sorry. <laughs> I was speaking to myself in my head and you're here. Don't tell them I did that. No. No. All right. Well, let's let's get him out of here. Touching this body doesn't the act anyway, right? No. Um, it, this is 
a much lighter. Like you said. Um, yeah, like uh, you would expect it to be fairly light, but it's probably even lighter than you'd imagine. It's almost like even the marrow is gone from the bones of this body. Like th this is very brittle and dry, um, and the clothes are, other than being bloody and scuffed up and torn, have have only been here for a couple of days. Um, the guards here don't wear a lot of armor, so it's pretty easy to pick this person up, and there might be a little bit of fumbling um, to keep all of the parts together, because um, I imagine it probably starts to break down in your hands, but you can certainly uh, you know, bound it up in the cloak or something like that and carry it uh, back to where you hear the, uh, the guards talking. Okay, so meanwhile, Eddard, you have brought back um, one of these guards, uh, and he has joined you back where Sir John and Ariana Shial are waiting beside the, the body of the Red Cap and uh, this puddle uh, that was once a guard. The guard walks, like, into the torchlight. Uh, that's that's going on and he kind of slows his steps immediately what 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 is that as soon as we stepped down here into the crypts we were beset upon it by a creature i don't know what this thing is is that is that a person he points to the puddle it, it was our our guide until she was attacked. He kind of like hurries over to the side and loses his, his breakfast um, violently. He comes back after a moment, kind of like, you know, wiping the corners of his mouth on his on his sleeve, and he's white as a sheet. Listen, this is very serious. If you can't handle this, I'm going to need you to get one of your higher-ups. Yes, of course, sir. Uh, what what happened? What happened here? We came down to visit the Pendrake Crypt, and we were beset upon by a creature. I'm not what? sure what kind of creature. Is it, is it still and around? It, no, it's killed. We killed it. Oh, he kind of looks down at this, like, red cap. This? Yes, that. He did... And he kind of points to the puddle. Yes, he melted your guard's skin off. If you can't tell the, the severity of the situation, please bring somebody else. Of, of course. Uh, he kind of pauses, m my lord. And he kind of bows and he turns and runs back down the hallway. And it'll be a moment, but eventually... Um, you hear other footsteps coming and you realize the voice that you're hearing is actually the Duke's. He is hurriedly walking um, with kind of a, a contingent of guards around him and he marches straight up to your group and looks around at the devastation. What is that? He looks at the creature. It appears you've had trespassers in your crypt. It's impossible. I don't mean to be rude, but what makes you so sure? We have, we have precautions in place. The guards at every every possible entrance day and night they, they rotate through sleep schedules so they're, they're not tired when they're on duty we have incantations in place and runes to help prevent the use of magic to enter this place my lord while I am sure the defenses you put in place are impregnable these were 
well well likely the effects of black magic this creature snuck in here and I point to the uh, the red cab he kind of looks down at it for a moment kind of nudges it with his boot and when he does so the entire body of this red cap turns to like powder and collapses in on itself very similar to fungus and there's a small little of dust and everybody kind of you know backs away and fans at their their mouth and nose um and all of you who look can see that there's nothing left of this red cap except for a single tooth that is lying kind of right in the middle of where his skull was he he turns to the rest of you and he said what is it about you that draws this kind of thing to you (coughs) i'm starting to regret my decision already my lord if i must i don't think that it was us this was a targeted attack on the pendrake crypts you keep saying that name but pendrake I, I, I can't find it in any history book that I've looked. It doesn't exist. Have you been to this crypt? To this level? Of course I have. I used to play here as a child. Allow me to show you something. And I kind of beckon him over. I'm going to bring him to, to Garland's crypt. And he looks and he says, See, this is what troubled me so. You mentioned that name, and I remembered this door, but only having seen it before. So the name Pendrake is... It is familiar to me, but again, there's no record of it anywhere, except for this crypt. I know. Trust me. Trust me, I know. I've been looking everywhere for information about this family name. Please, if if you... If you wish to be the inside the door is open your guard was able to let us in before <sighs> before everything tell. happened yes she opened the door for us see he kind of reaches out and opens the door and steps inside sees the the smashed you know bits of the the ritual site at the end of the the sarcophagus how and if you have any doubt about the Pendrake name, please have a look at this. And he points to the top of the sarcophagus, which is still in pieces, but put together now. He reads this this inscription, and he kind of just quietly shakes his head and says, King Mazarin Cabrain, if he was such a trusted knight, and as it says here, brother of, of the king... Why no mention of him? Well, if you read the last part of the statement, it does mention betrayal. Yes. Perhaps he had his name's wiped from the history books. That's so, then. It's a much different picture of Mather and Gabrain than I've ever heard before. Likewise. It's true. Well, I am sorry to hear that there were not more answers for you down here. No, not beyond what is laid in stone. No, don't don't apologize to me. We should be apologizing to you. We failed to save those two guards. Yes, they will be they will be sorely missed and they will have a proper burial. So what happens next? Are you to head to Malric? Is there more pressing business that you have? What what are you going to do? This was the last of it, as far as I know. Uh, my companions here wanted me to find some closure here, but the only thing I've found is more questions. So I think we'll be off soon, probably by next daylight. He kind of looks at uh, at the whole group and kind of sees you uh, and uh, Tord and Dane kind of returning with this uh, 
this other guard's remains. He just kind of heaves this big exhale. I fear that whatever that creature is could potentially have done much more harm if it had remained down here. And I don't take lightly to the fact that there is a black magic ritual set up here in the crypts. I appreciate you dealing with that, both of those situations. And I wonder if as way of saying thank you, perhaps I could send the five of you to Malridge via the teleportation circle that we have here. Would be well appreciated. It is not often that it is used, but there's certainly call for it, I would say. It is an expensive ritual to enact, but uh, we would be more than more than happy to to pay for that very well uh, if you would like um, I can make the arrangements tonight and you should be able to depart in the morning if you still wish it's fine by me how does everyone else feel Tomorrow morning? I'd like to sleep. At least once in the... You know. Very well. Then, uh, then I will make the arrangements. And you will be ready to go uh, whenever you are ready in the morning. Thank you, my lord. If you are going to represent House Lathelbrin in in the games, try to avoid the kind of trouble that seems to follow you. If you would, please. I assure you we will do everything in our power. I trust that you will, Lord Edit. Very well. Then uh, if you will excuse me, I have some business to attend to here. Edit bows. If I remember correctly, we had uh, booked some rooms at an inn nearby, correctly? Yes, um, I believe that is correct. Okay. I forget what it's called, even though it was like <clears throat> a big plot piece for me to go meet Reagan. I completely forgot the name. I think it had goat in it. That sounds right. Pretty sure there's at least a goat on the sign. <laughs> yeah. It probably actually didn't even have writing on the outside. Okay. So, you all are going to be able to head back to the the tavern and get a long rest again the beds here are clean they're dry they're warm uh, the food is halfway decent it's actually not a bad little place to stay uh, is there anything else that you would like to accomplish before you travel via teleportation circle the next day yes once everybody's settled down into their rooms. I visit Ariana Shell's room. Edder just walks up to the door and he raps on it gently. Hi. Ari, it's Edder. Oh, do come in. He comes in. And uh, he just sits down at the at one of the tables in the uh, in the room. He kind of just starts. It's been a couple of days now since his thing has gone missing. And he just kind of starts to let it fly. And he's like, Ari, um, you know, you I don't want to say this, but 
you've known me longer than anybody else. We were acquaintances and then friends later in Warrington. And you know how much I used to write all the time. And something, I, I can't seem to find my quill. Have you seen it? I've torn my room upside down, gone through the bag a hundred times. I can't find it anywhere. Wait, you're saying that beautiful little quill thing that you always are writing with. As yeah, one. I can't find it anywhere. I mean, normally it's like, yeah, just go down to the shop and buy another quill, but this is my grandfather's quill. It's gone. You're saying I, it's gone. I can't find it anywhere. Uh, and how long has it been gone? Two, three days, maybe. Two days or three is a very important. I asked Tord about it. He said nothing, or he, he had nothing to say about it. I haven't been doing a lot of writing. And you last saw it when? It was in my room, in my pack, the night after I met with Reagan. After that, I can't recall seeing it again. You remember what it looks like? It looked just like the one from the shop in Kerwall. I do. This is distressing, Edward. It's gone missing. Have you... I, I know she's a good friend of yours and all, but have you asked her? No, I haven't had the time to set up another message, but if we're going to Malric, I can ask her. Maybe she's seen it. Let's hope so. I know how much this means to you, and I know... Well... It's very valuable. I mean, we saw the thing in the, the other shop. Yes, it was expensive. I, it. I mean, but it's not about the money, obviously. It's a, a family heirloom. Edward looks distressed. He kind of exhales long and gets up out of the chair. He looks at you and then he gives you a, like a slight smile. He says, thanks, Ari. I appreciate it. I, I know I can't <laughs> be asking everybody to be responsible for my belongings. I just thought maybe somebody had seen it. Well, you can, you can be guaranteed that I will be spending all my time looking for this thing. It's got to be found. It's not found. I mean, we're leaving tomorrow, so if I don't find it now, I don't. I really don't know. When will be the next time we come back here? That's not good. It's not good at all. Maybe can you? Well, never mind. What is it? Well, this is, can you talk to Reagan? Find out before we leave. Uh, yeah, I can, I can send her a message. Just give me a moment. Maybe she didn't know, or maybe she just moved it, and we can find it before we leave. Okay, I'll, I'll ask. So Edward takes the proper steps to set up a message spell to Reagan. Or, I'm sorry, not message. Message is the cantrip. It's called sending. And it is a message, 25 words or shorter, can be sent across planes. And the gist of it is just that he asks Reagan if he's seen, or if she has seen his quill before she left. Because he can't locate it anywhere. And he sends that message off, and he just kind of opens his eyes. and Shouldn't be much longer now. He kind of chuckles to himself. The thought of her being able to instantly respond to this makes him laugh. Yeah, there's just a, a brief moment um, before you get the answer. Um, and Reagan is saying, essentially, she saw it uh, whenever you were writing with it. Um, the things she was telling you, the, guy, the things you guys were discussing, she, you were writing part of it down but that she has no idea what could have happened to it after that. Uh, and then she asks a single word question. 
scry question mark uh i don't know if i can respond back to it i think i have to cast another spell yeah i think to it's do a it. once in back kind of thing per casting but i will absolutely respond yes with another spell slot, I'll, I'll waste the third level. Well, I wouldn't call it a waste, but I'll use the third level spell slot to say then. Okay. Um, there's a longer pause this time, as your guess is she is um, using a spell to, uh, to cast a scry for you. And after the moment kind of passes, the response that comes back is, I saw your elven friend running through the woods with it. Have you asked her? Oh, boy. So, Ari, it's been like... <clears throat> probably like a solid like two or three minutes of just probably the most tension filled silence you've ever spent in the vicinity of it or in a long time, probably ever. And he just turns to you with like this puzzled look on his face. And She she said she hadn't seen it after I had finished writing in my journal the night we last saw each other. And he kind of hesitates for a second. However, she performed a ritual for me to find this quill. And she asked me if I had asked you. She said she saw you running through the woods with it. She lies. Okay. This is where my class comes into play. I'm going to roll an insight. Okay. Um... Let's get a deception roll um, to counter that, if you would, please, Karen. If you want, Karen, you can uh, send me. I'll your, PM it to you. Yeah, you guys can both PM me your. Uh, you can send. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay. So, Ari has answered you, um, and. You're not sure if, if if she's lying, Eddard, but there is something that seems to be troubling Ari, and she is not putting words to it currently. There's, there's a part of the story that you haven't heard. He kind of narrows his eyes at you. Very well. And he stands from the table. He says, thanks again, Ari. And he just walks out the room. Okay. <clears throat> I think as Eddard walks out the room, he closes the door behind him. Ari is just probably staring after him as he goes out the room. And so none of you can see it. Um, there's a look of confusion and then almost bewilderment before she sits down heavily upon her bed and just sits there and you can see she's thinking. And then he goes back. Bum, bum, bum. <clears throat> I love you guys. Awesome. All right. So, 
Next morning, you guys are able to wake, prepare yourselves, and are able to meet at the teleportation circle, or meet downstairs in the tavern and travel there, whatever. But the point is, you are getting swooped across the kingdom to Malrich. I believe I have the map. So let me see if I can do this. No, I lied to you. Wait, there it is. So you guys have been in Vicaril, kind of way off to the west, um, kind of out on the large part of the island, uh, the continent that sticks out. And you guys are headed to Malrich, which is pretty much dead center to the kingdom. Um, so taking the trip through the teleportation circle, you have traveled what would have taken you probably something like a week um, on horseback. So, you have stepped out of the teleportation circle ring in Malrich. The old capital, Vikril, where you have just come from, there was a lot of elven and dwarven features kind of worked into the architecture. Everything is from a a highly romanticized, um, very famous era of your history. That's when King Matherin Gabrain was was ruling the height of his power, the, the golden age of the kingdom. When you step out into Malrich, the architecture here is much, much less elven. There are still dwarven aspects, um, but this place, although it is still ornate, seems to have been built very pragmatically. The walls are high, they're thick, they have large ramparts on them. The people who built this city were expecting non-peaceful times. Um, and it's very clear from the way that everything was built here. But that's not the only thing that catches your attention as you're stepping off of this teleportation circle. The other thing is that this city is crammed full of people. There are other people who have just, you know, taken the trip through the tele teleportation circle, who are off to the side talking to someone, getting oriented, and somebody is ushering you quickly off of the platform because at any moment somebody else could be trying to come through behind you. And it's obvious that everyone is here for a tournament. So, as you have now arrived, in the grand capital city of Malrich. What would you like to do? Is there any... Is there, like, a elevator pitch for Malrich? Like, what are some common things here or like rumors or well-known or maybe stereotypes of this place what is something that like obviously outside of the capital it's like something we would have been aware of about this place i guess is what i'm asking so this place was built kind of on the the tail end of uh matherin gabrain's uh reign it was when the construction for the city kind of started, um, and it was finished long after he had passed. Um, and this city has kind of become the more um, contemporary uh, hot zone, if you will, of the country, of the, of the kingdom. Um, this is the, the place where most things are happening, because again, this is where the seat of the monarchy is now. Uh, this is the new current capital. But it's also built on uh, the north shore of Lake Kelmium. So it's 
a bustling port. Uh, things that kind of come and go from specifically from the dwarves in the east. Uh, so there's a lot of dwarves who have taken up residence here. Uh, and as far as any of the cities that you've been to so far, this place would have the largest dwarven population that you have seen thus far. I hear the dwarves brew a fine ale. You know what, Tord? I've heard that too. Why don't we see to it? Sir John uh, woke up that morning and dressed in his very finest tournament clothes. We're talking slashed sleeves. We're talking ruffles. We're talking chains of gold uh, to symbolize his knightly authority. He is decked and there's this uh, kerchief that's been tucked into his sleeve. Uh, it's not exactly like effeminate dress. It's very fancy. It has some like military flair, but it's certainly not the usual gruff and tumble that we've seen from him. He's anybody who knows him is like, who's he trying to impress? <laughs> He's wearing white. <laughs> right. <laughs> So basically, as soon as he gets to Malrich, uh, he's like, well, Sir Dane, you no longer need my supervision. I'm going to go uh, mingle with the crowds for a moment. Um, uh, but who announces you? Oh, uh, don't worry about that. I have a herald, after all. And... <clears throat> if you're going to compete, uh, who, who who's going to polish your armor? And uh, you you like almost get those words out, and then all of a sudden, Sir John's like, "Wait a moment! No, I fired my herald because he was incompetent. Uh, we'll find someone to do it." I'm sorry, <clears throat> you were talking about armor. Uh, so I've heard in the past. Uh, from my father, he traveled a lot. That during the tournaments, there are bards essentially for hire. Most of them, there's, there's, uh, I can't remember the term, uh, a squawking post, I think. L literally, like a, almost like a maypole that's been raised. Different uh, bards and, and heralds have their personal colors sort of flying around it and they're hireable for the tournaments. You could get one of them, I suppose. I could go with you and uh, make suggestions. Uh, you know what? That sounds wonderful. Uh, let's let's plan to do that this evening when I think they'll be out and about. Ah. Uh, so you're going to go talk to the other knights and stuff then? Yes, the other knights. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sir John, a word of warning. If you're going to hire a bard to sing your praises, pretty much any bard will do it for a small amount of coin. But I would suggest having a conversation with them first to find out who the good ones are. Um, so Sir John like claps Lord Eddard on the shoulder and he says, My dear Lord, this is not my first tournament, although I appreciate the advice. Uh, perhaps you should give it to our uh, young Sir Dane before he goes off and acquires one of these bards for himself. I'm supposed to go get a bard? Well, you're competing, aren't you? Hold yeah. on. Is everyone getting bards? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to have someone to announce. And then Dan kind of stands up taller for a second. All of us. <laughs> does, does anyone want to go halves? Maybe we should a hire a bard to announce our entire group. The Sword of Vicarus. Yeah, we, we like all split it five ways. That sounds plenty merciless. I think it would do good for the tournament. Do we have an accord? Uh, Sir John says, looking right at Ari. Uh, sure. Hold on. You're going to fight in the tournament too. 
Is that wow? Oh, hold on, are we all fighting? No, 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 no. I am not fighting. Dane. Am I? Am I fighting? Are you fighting? Please fight with us, Dane. Are you not? Am I supposed to? Ah, uh, well, I suppose no one's going to force you, but I'm going to force you. I think if you're a knight, you have to fight in the tournament. Those are the rules, last I checked. It's my first time, and I'm, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Oh, Dane, you just swing the sword. Pointy end goes in the guy. Yes, you've done it before. We're actually really good. Yes, past, exper- uh, past performances have proved that, I think. Okay. I, but I don't have to joust, right? Don't have to joust, he says. <laughs> Tord, did you hear him? <laughs> I mean, you don't have to eat the food you buy either, but you do uh, because that's the best part. Precisely. Not gonna joust. Wait. Think- <laughs> do people buy food? We buy food. Have you done? <laughs> I haven't I've- bought any food. I've bought all of his food. Sir Dane, you never cease to amaze. Well, I guess um, I need to go. I don't own a lance. Uh, do they supply lance? No, that would be silly. All right. Well, yeah, you guys, uh, uh, well, I've got a. Uh, all right. If I may suggest, Sir Dane, uh, the blacksmith's row is this way, and Sir John points down <laughs> the road. So Dane's like walking in the wrong direction, and it's like, oh, yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> do blacksmiths make lances? Aren't they made out of wood? I... John, he needs help buying his first lance. So, Tord, why don't you take care of that? I've got urgent business to attend to. I don't remember it being my idea to knight him. Uh, you were there. You participated in the ceremony. I merely agreed. And you're hey. a knight yourself. You need a lance. I haven't seen you trucking one around. I've had my retainers bring mine along. Dane comes running back. What about horses? You ride horses? And we teleported. Oh, well, no. Can... My horse came with us. <laughs> I didn't bring my horse! And my mule. And, I did uh, oh, Dane <laughs> comes going to need... And they the ushered the whole wagon off the <laughs> teleportation circle. Where were you, Sudane? Are you are you, are you truly so flustered right now? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, fine. Let's go take care of this. I'll postpone my business. His ring belt uh, like put on wrong, and like because <laughs> he's your used swords to on the wrong side else. of your <laughs> hips. <laughs> it's, it's backwards. So I'm always used to dressing Sir John. Ah, oh, Sudane. This is going to take more work than I thought. It wasn't my idea to knight me either. (laughs) (laughs) Are you questioning my judgment, former squire? That's okay. That's nothing new. All right. So about that ale. (laughs) Well, you see, I hear that the compilation between human hops and dwarven brewing techniques, we got to try it. I'm with you. Is there a... You guys know about tournaments. Do we need to register somewhere? Is there like a a clerk that takes care of all the entrants? Perhaps we should enter before we go about preparing for it. Yeah, that makes sense. It's probably the fancy guys at the table in the tents over there. Uh Constance, my quartermaster, is already taking care of that for everyone. So, oh, wait. Thank you, Sir John. Does that mean Constance was registering me before I knew I was being registered? I assumed a knight would want to participate in the tournament. <laughs> we all chipped in. It's your first tournament, Sir Dane. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It'll be okay, Dane. Not all tournaments are fights to the death like you've seen. Well, not the good ones. They're not. Listen, Dane, you see all of these wonderful people. You'll go to fight. 
one of them will fall hopelessly in love with you. You'll receive gifts of their affection, favors, favors, and and uh, mine were kind of weird witchcrafty things, but yours probably won't be like that. So, well, you're saying that this tournament is so that somebody will fall in love with you? Well, that's one of the fringe benefits. Yes, it's that's kind of a, a a compound thing. Also, I mean, it was the only thing Tord really had going for him. Well, and let's not forget this is an opportunity for all of us to fall in love as well. So we're here so you can date someone? Uh, so I, again, fringe benefits. There, I are, have... <laughs> there are lances, there are swords, and there are lovers. This is what a tournament is. So I have to fight a tournament and get married? No, no, no. no marriage? No. Do you have someone to intercede? Do you have lands and titles that you can offer? What, what <laughs> Dane? I, I, we'll be I'm, busy at the tournament. You can get married. I'm, I'm gonna go pick out a horse now. Yes, yes, come, come. Let's pick it out together. <laughs> I'm going to save you from this tournament if it's the last thing I do. All right, we're gonna. Do you want to come with us? Me and Edward. And I'm kind of like grasping Edward around the shoulder, like trying to bring you in close proximity to us. Are you going to get tipsy? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Just appreciating the culture. Hey, let's do that. That sounds much more fun than what they're doing. Besides, it looks like Sir John set us all up for the tournament anyway. I hope he didn't register me to fight because I'm not going. A lord doesn't fight. The knight fights for the lord unless the lord wants to fight. You're right, Tord. That's why I made you my first knight. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so you guys settle in uh, the three of you and find that there's a lot of places um, the inns and taverns around town have kind of pulled out all the stops um, they're definitely trying to impress and accommodate the the large influx of people who are coming to the city so there's plenty of uh, choice to be made about where you might want to spend your money and you manage to find yourself uh, at a place where uh, there's a lot of accommodations uh, being touted. Among them, that there is being served there Golden Buzz. It's a honey mead uh, that I know one of you is familiar with, at least. Uh, there's also spiced wine and a dwarven ale that is favored by the Angorians. It's something that you've had, but only had in your home, Tord. Uh, what is that called? Seeing this, seeing this on the menu, um, you see it is a. Uh, that's a hard question to put. <laughs> it's gonna sound good. This is turn a pop. Ale. Did you say turnips? And and hops. Is there any meat in it? No. Oh, well, good. no. Are you sure? Yes. Well, I'll try one. Barkeep, three turnip hop ales. This is an Angorian drink, you said, Dord. Actually, dwarven. Dwarven? But we, I guess the exact acquisition of this, I'm not really sure of, but where Maybe I'm from, we, we, we call it a hop slammer. No. It really. They're real good. Well, if you say it's real good, I'll take your word for it. And I am—I imagine it's almost 
like just the side of the malt. It's like you, you drink it and you gotta chew it down. <laughs> you gotta chew it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. The bottom of it's just rancid. The meal like replacement. Sediment. Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh it's thick, it's strong. Um I would imagine it's it's probably a little bit of an acquired taste. It's the kind of drink that you only really enjoy after like your third or fourth sip. Um, when you can no longer actually. Yeah. <laughs> when your body's kind of drinking. gotten used to it. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very good. It's also very expensive. Um, so you've, uh, you certainly have to put down some coin for it. How much coin? Um, let's call it a gold piece per glass. You gotta savor it, guys. This is the good stuff. Drink it slow. Before you can say that, Eddard's already taken like a big swig out of it. <laughs> feel it? You feel it? It's yeah, like... I feel it. I feel it. <sighs> really releases the tension in the shoulders. Yeah. I think my nostrils are more clear than they've been in months. Yeah, exactly. We do that. The winds. Matter of fact, I think I'm breathing a little better. Than, you know what, Torn? I got to hand it to you, bud. Ari, yeah. I think Ari's been kind of looking at Eddard and watching him kind of not quite gag over this, but <laughs> as he takes the big, big swallow, she's kind of looking at it really. Um, with some apprehension and she gives it a kind of a sniff and uh, not quite sure what it smells like but it's nothing that she's really ever smelled before so she kind of takes a little sip she kind of studies for a bit and then she takes a little bigger of a sip and then maybe a bigger sip it's not bad it kind of tastes like dirt well a staple of the Angorian diet is a lot of root vegetables, to be honest. I know what I mean like, by dirt. I mean, like, you know, those. Like the fungus that grows on it. it kind of reminds me of home. And she'll take yeah, it exactly. It reminds me of home, too. Maybe you two had more in common than you thought. No, that's cool. Well, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Excellent. Well, speaking of home, I would really like to go back to mine soon. Permitting, of course. I don't want to. Of course, Tord. I'm sure once all of this tournament business settles down and we hear back from uh, the Lathobrins, I'm sure there will be time for us to visit your home. Matter of fact, we should make it a priority. I really think you guys would like Ma. She really knows how to welcome you home. Whereabouts is your home from here? It's to the east in Shannon, just outside of the major city. We make do away from the looking around. He kind of shrugs. Well, not like this, but the hustle and bustle of the mainstay. It's peaceful. It smells like horse, but it's peaceful. What? As you guys are all sitting there, um, enjoying you know, the the roasted pheasant and uh, roasted boar and uh, things of that nature to go along with um, your drinks. Another um, Angorian um, spots you, Tord, and he's not familiar to you, but he looks at you and he crosses towards you. And as he's approaching in Orcish, he says, "Are you are you Angorian?" You, are you from Angle? 
What kind of question is that? Well, I, I, I mean, obviously you 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 know someone there, or were born of someone there, but we're, do you call it home? I, I do. Do you call it home? I did, for a long time. I was, uh, was really looking forward to seeing them compete, you know? But, it's a damn shame. What is? You hadn't heard? House Kremenak isn't, isn't competing. Why? Uh, said the, the raiding skirmishes have started up again and they're, they're bad. They've actually asked yeah. for help in repelling the orcs from the eastern borders this time. I hadn't heard. Yeah, apparently there's some warlord out there on the steps that's... He's put together some kind of sizable force and is wreaking hell up, all up and down the, the border. Well, uh... You... Are you competing? I'm going to place another gold piece on the table and give him one of these ales and then like kind of gesture for him to sit down. I am. This is my lord. Your, your lord? He kind of looks over at Eddard, almost confused for just a minute. Oh, uh, he kind of switches to common. Uh, how are you, my lord? And he kind of bows. You can tell it's not something he's super comfortable doing. Um. I'm well. Uh, my name is Lord Edward Bainton Pendrick. It's a pleasure when he holds out his hand to the Angorian to shake. He'll shake your hand. Do you know my friend Tord here? No. No, no uh, we've never met before. In, until just now, of course, but... Orcs never knew strangers. Yeah, very good. Why don't you join us? Well, thank you, my lord. He kind of looks my pleasure. to make sure that that's okay with everybody. Um, also, kind of his eyes setting upon Ariana Shial for a moment. You are willing to sit at our table, aren't you? Well, of course I am, but uh, he kind of gestures towards Ariana Shiel weakly and kind of switches back to Orcish toward and says is she okay with it? The elves, they tend to not. Ari, he wonders if you're alright with it since he's an at orc. I think Ari kind of um, she doesn't move she just kind of sits straight, but you've been around her for months now, and you can see that she is very tense. And she has been watching this person um, the entire time he's been talking. I'm so tired, not understanding a word he's been saying. And then when you say something to her, she kind of just looks at you and she just kind of gives you that look like how dare you even ask me right i uh, apologize i guess i forget sometimes work with me i'd like to speak a bit more with you if we can he kind of uh nods to you and kind of looks at ariana shial as if apologetic that he did something wrong uh and he gets up and takes his his tanker that was that was given to him and he kind of bows to you once again eddard lord go forth it was a pleasure likewise and he kind of casts another look at ariana shial before turning and walking away with you toward How recently have you come from Shannon? It's been 
five year, six, maybe. Perhaps you left around the same time I did. Well, I guess my question is, do you have any intentions on going back? Do you have family? No, no. My family's all dead and gone by now. I might go back someday, but uh, for now the work's here, so that's that's where I am. Didn't catch your name. My name is Masaka Tord. Masaka Tord, it's a, a pleasure to meet you. I'm Garnock. Well, Garnock. Anything I should be taking the time to see while I'm here before I participate in the journey. Well, if you're participating, maybe uh, maybe I'll have to round up some coin. Wasn't planning on placing any bets, but um, maybe I ought to. Well, I say it's not gambling if you know you're going to win. <laughs> he kind of laughs. Very true. Um, this is fantastic, by the way. I haven't had any of this in ages. Thank you. He kind of points to the tankard. Feels like home. It does. It does. As for what you can uh, kind of see and do while you're in town, or, uh, the tournament's going to be probably taking up most of the time, I imagine. But um, there's a few good spots I could point out to you. A few places where there's uh, more of us, if you'd like. Yeah. I'd like that. I've got a better plan for who should bet on. His colors are red, yellow, and black. He wears the sigil of an eagle. You'll see him. Real gaudy type. Damn good fighter, though. All right. Maybe we'll have to keep an eye out for both of you, then. You'll see him. Excellent. So yeah, he kind of points you um, towards a couple of different sites that you can visit while you're in the city. Um, you know, like a, a tavern that's run by an orc, uh, serves you know more orcish um, styled food, things of that nature. Um, there's probably a a stretch of houses that you know is mainly populated by orcish t orcish tenants um, owned by orcish people. So like a little mini you know, uh, Shaneen, uh, uh, almost represented there. Um, so, Sir John and Dane, you have managed to make your way towards uh, purchasing Dane's equipment, finding a horse for him, getting a lance, uh, finding a herald for you, Sir John. Uh, none of this has been difficult to acquire. Uh, it definitely seems like people have anticipated the the influx of business here and had uh, prepared for it ahead of time. But it's while the two of you are out and about that Dane you have never seen this woman before however you know her in an instant because she has been described to you I would imagine in no small amount of poetic detail you see shopping in one of the, uh, the, the carts um, not that far away from where you are now you see the Lady Laudine of Astwin you know that she has long been somebody who Sir John may not admit that he's obsessed with 
but anybody who knows him, I would say, is fairly aware of it. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> oh, so John, you're saying that uh, I don't need more than one one lance. That uh, the other, if they break the other ones, they sub. Oh, um, t- uh, uh, um. So, Dane, I, focus. Right. Uh, I need you to not turn around. What? And I Just, immediately turn around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there, in all of her immaculate grace and exquisite beauty, shining as if she were reflecting the light of the sun, Lady, <gasps> Lady Laudine. Of Astowin. Ho oh, ho oh, oh. So Dane. Oh, no, no. No. My young, my young squire. My young squire. And I'm like reaching back trying to grab <laughs> trying to grab him and like pull him up here. So it's his. <sighs> and then I don't pull him up. I actually pull myself back behind him. I also imagine for some reason that I'm a little taller than you, like <laughs> yeah. like I'm hiding behind you, but yeah, I'm not hidden. <laughs> right, right, I'm right. Like, it, it's the it's the lady. Um, <clears throat> yes, the yes. Lady Laudine. Yes, she yes. is here. At yes, the tournament. Yes. Oh. So Dane, um, uh, uh, do I? How do I look? How do I look? Uh, I, uh, I turn you around. <laughs> so I I <clears throat> I adjust a, a few things and. Um, <clears throat> Uh man. As soon as you start adjusting me, uh, my clothes, my face goes as red as my shirt, and I, mm. I realize what's happening, and I drag you into an alley, and I'm like, all right, now all that right. we're out of sight, how are we going to do this? I, right. I don't have a poem on me. I don't, have a, I don't even have paper to write a letter. What am I going uh, to do? All right. So. Breathe. <sighs> In and out. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, can you give me a procession check there, so, so, Eli? So, uh, yeah. Oh, God. I don't have a D20 out. <laughs> Whoops. Where are my D20s? Are they nowhere? I don't think I have them right now. Where? Can you roll a perception check for me and I'll just tell you my modifier? Yeah, yeah. What, okay, no, got? I found one. We're All good. Right. Okay, I got. I did not pass. I got a two on the die. Okay, no problem. Uh, just, just so you're aware, uh, I've taken your kerchief out of your, uh, your sleeve. Oh. Okay, yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right. So, um, you need a poem. Yes. Uh, and I, I reach into my like my my pouch and I pull out like a, a piece of like charcoal chalk, and I like turn you to face the wall of this stall, and I hand you the chalk. All right. Put some words together. I'm going to go get a few things for you. I'll meet you right back here. Of course, of course, yes. I'll, I'll get to work immediately, and I just like start scribbling on the wall as much as I can. Um, I'm gonna go slide back around to the uh, the front, um, and as I do, I'm sort of like rummaging through my my pockets, and uh, I produce this small ceramic jar maybe about the size of like a soda can and uh i sort of steal myself and stand up as tall as i can and i walk over towards this uh lady ladine um as you're kind of approaching one of her um maids in waiting sees you coming and kind of leans closer to her and whispers something and she turns and looks in your direction. She says, Oh, you're of House Lightenor. 
Yes, my lady. Uh, a knight very recently, but oh, well, faithful servant for some time now. Oh, you're too kind. Uh, my, I almost wanted to say master. My instructor, my former master, the gentleman whose knowledge and bravery and deeds have gotten me this far, he asked me to bring two things for you. May I? Well, does your mentor know that I am a spoken for woman? That I am married? He does. And his intentions are pure. Nothing. She kind of looks to her handmaiden, who's almost like giggling, and she kind of says, very well, then please proceed. So I'm going to hand the stuff I have to the handmaiden rather than directly to this lady. Mm. And so I start off with this ceramic jar and I take the lid off of it. And there is this beautiful sort of amber colored honey that uh, we got so long ago uh, that I hope is still good in this uh, ceramic thing. And I, I pass it, you know, sort of lid slightly ajar to this, uh, this lady in waiting. This is some honey, simple, but something that in my training we picked up. And one night we, after a hard fought battle and much bravery, there was a story shared around the fire. And the thing that stuck out in my mind and I'm sure in yours, as he sort of eloquently spoke of you, was that although this is a prized honey from a far region, that you were something in act and nobility and stature that was far sweeter than even this, but that he would have it given to you so that you could experience 1% of what he experienced when he first met you. And I sort of give her the, the jar. And she's like visibly blushing at this point. And she says, so then your mentor friend knows, knows me, or at least thinks he does. And she kind of yes. like, tastes some of the honey. You can see the, the expression of her cha of her face changes drastically. This is this is amazing. He, my lady, if I may say, if I learned not the sword, I did learn of you. And lastly, and I'll pull out his uh, his kerchief. Although you are spoken for, and he could not take a token of yours such as this, might you simply wipe your brow with this so that he could hold something that has been as close to you as that? She takes it and kind of looks at it for just a I moment. I know. Um, she says... I know this. Your I, I just smile like this knowing smile. Your mentor is Sir John Lightenall. I don't say anything. I just nod and bow my head. She kind of, you can tell, kind of starts to light up, beam a little, and then kind of gets it under control. And she kind of looks around... And then you can see, like, a, a small impish grin kind of turn the corner of her mouth. And she takes her finger and kind of in earnest dips it into the honey and kind of tastes it. And you can see that she purposefully leaves some of it on her lips. And then she actually kisses the handkerchief. And then folds it very carefully and gives it back to you. And I'll, I'll bow and take it from her. 
please deliver this to your mentor with my blessings. And I hope he fares well in the tournament. I will be looking for him. And he will be thinking of you. And I just turn and... Well, I'll back away, and then I'll turn and leave. The moment that you leave, you hear the whispering commence. The, uh, like, the intense, um, chittery, gossipy, um, you know, language of these two, um, just going over what just happened. Um, <clears throat> excellent. So, uh, Dane, you return and you find <clears throat> Sir John. An empty alley. Scribbling. <laughs> um, and there are scribbles on the wall. They are not words. They are just scribbles. And Sir John is nowhere to be found. But eventually you hear kind of a whimpering from behind some barrels. And he's just like leaned up against the wall with his head in his hands. And he's like, this is not going to work. Oh, I do not have time. I'm not at peace. My muse, I haven't seen my muse in so long. I am stymied, Sir Dane. Are you done? Or would you like to wallow next to the pigs as well? Excuse me? I stand up and I start strutting around. There we go. This is an outrage. How dare you tell me that I'm a pig compared... I, I was your knight. You were my squire, and this is how you treat me? I have something for you. What? What could you possibly have for me right now? So I hold out this folded kerchief. Uh, 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 and I check my, my sleeve. You, you took that from me. Careful. What? You I be careful. Of, this is I make I, I make this I make this uh, like sort of unfolding motion with my hand. <gasps> I'm going to win this tournament for the name of Lady Laudina Vastowin. I shall, and I shall proclaim it to the heavens. Yes. So, John, what? Um, who else might be fighting for her? Doesn't matter. <laughs> As if they could withstand me, Sir Dane. <laughs> this really is your first tournament, isn't it? Well, I'd much rather see you on that cloud than down there in the rubbish. Oh, trust me. <laughs> you have bolstered me, my young friend, and now it is time to... Uh, uh, what were we doing here? Why are we here? Were we going to, were we in search of Lady we, we, we No, no, we were about done. And she said that uh, she would, of course, attend your bouts and look for you. But huh? she did ask that until the moment that you win, that don't proclaim anything yet. Of course, I will maintain the utmost secrecy. I shall not even reveal myself. I shall remain helmeted throughout the entire tournament. And I shall be the Knight of Lathelbrun. Yes, that's it. This is genius. This is going to work at long last. She will see me for who I really am. Yes, she will. Sir Dane, come. Let us finish your outfitting. We must... We, we must find the trim uh, for your pennant, of course. <laughs> Come with me. Wait, I, I start to move him out of the alley, and then I'm like, oh, 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 has she gone yet? Is she still out there? I look around the corner. Go check, go check, yes. You see that they are, have kind of wandered off, uh, still kind of very hushed talking amongst themselves, kind of into another shop, and they're definitely not even looking your direction any longer. I think you're safe. Oh, good. Wonderful. All right, let us be off. Fantastic. This is rocketing to the top of my favorite episodes so far. <laughs> Hard <laughs> same. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
a couple other things that I want to make sure to touch on. Like I said, I have some of these little bullet points that I want to try to hit. Um, Eddard, at some point, you are out or maybe you even just by like an open window I would um, be out out and about okay uh, yeah I've got a couple of errands to run before we get situated with the tournament perfect um, why are you playing a particularly exquisite brass flute that you happen to carry with you why am I playing it at this moment Probably just playing like a simple tune as I walk. Probably like one of the first tunes that I learned in Warrington. It's actually a piccolo. It's not it's not a flute. It's smaller. But yeah, I mean like not definitely not as common. You're walking past um an area that has set up some temporary kind of outside seat, uh, seating just under a tent and kind of a, a little bit of a tucked away place between these two, excuse me, these two corners of a building. As you do so, playing this, this piccolo, there's a voice uh, from someone in the, the area where who, who you've kind of passed uh, by who calls out to you, uh, excuse me? He turns to face the voice, not yet breaking the tune. He actually doesn't stop playing until the tune's over. And then he puts the piccolo down and he gives a smile. You turn to see a woman who who looks pretty different um, than most Vicarillians. Uh, most Vicarillians tend to have uh, blonde hair. She's definitely darker haired and darker complected. Uh, com um, complected? complexion, uh, whatever that word would be, has a darker complexion. Um, and you can tell by her voice, she sounds to definitely be from uh, what your guess would be is probably Gerdes, <clears throat> which for just your sake, meta-wise, is kind of the uh, Spanish-French uh, type. Uh, they live across the sea, but they are uh, accomplished sailors. As a matter of fact, you have met a few Gerdins before. There was a traveling troop that came through your town um, not all that long ago. And it's actually where you happen to come across this piccolo. She looks a little um, peeved. Where did you get that? He just gives an earnest smile. Uh, it was a gift. Uh, Traveling troop passed through my hometown some years ago, and it was given to me. Would your town happen to be Warrington? Yes. How did you... Uh... Thief! That flute belonged to my sister. It went missing not long after she visited your town of Warrington. A gift, you say. She steps forward and she kind of like starts to unbutton like her surcoat. You can see that she's got like a, a strange looking sword at her hip. It has a very um, ornate kind of twisted basket that surrounds the handle. And the blade is very narrow. No, no, I don't think this is all necessary. If you want it back, it's yours. I certainly didn't mean for this gift to have been stolen property. Had I known, I would have never accepted it. You are not the one who stole it, then. No, like I said, it was given to me. She narrows her eyes at you and kind of, like, studies your face for a minute. Very well. She stops and she kind of starts rebuttoning her surcoat. And she bows and says, Forgive the implication against your character. I don't take it lightly, but I understand. Apology accepted. You play it better than she ever did anyways. She kind of like throws <laughs> her hand up dismissively. 
the hard look that he had put on of Sirius just gives way to the the smile he cracks. Come on, it, she couldn't have been that bad. Was she was she a member of that troop? Yes, she was his leader. She had the hair more like you. It was golden in color. Well, look, I... Even if I wasn't the one that stole it, or if it actually was given to me, regardless of the circumstances, I think you should take it back with you. This Piccolo has accompanied me on uh, many travels throughout the past couple of months, and I think that what is given uh, should be returned. There's more knowledge and history with this flute now than was given to me. And I think that she will understand that. And please tell her that I do remember the performance and I don't remember her being as bad as you think. She kind of half-heartedly laughs. She said, well, I would return it to her if she were still among us. Sadly, she is no longer living. Oh no, my condolences. Oh. Yes, <clears throat> it is uh, the ache upon my heart stings. It is still too soon, but perhaps that is why I was so fast to react. Forgive me. Well, if that's the case, then. You should definitely have this. She studies you again. Um, and then nods. Very well. I will take this on my sister's behalf. But um, I would have your name. And a drink. Absolutely. Uh, Lord Eddard Pendrake. You are a lord. She kind of stammers for a second. Forgive my rudeness, truly. Please don't think anything of it. Here. And about the drink. Yes, yes, of course. Um, and she kind of like scoots aside the wine that they, that what her and her friends at the table had been drinking, and she kind of like motions for a, a more expensive variety. Um, kind of makes one of her friends move so that you can have a place to sit at the table. And uh, I assume that there is a lot of drinking and chattering and a lot of research done by Eddard to learn about their culture. He asks a lot of questions, but he can't write it down. He just, uh, he kind of makes mental notes of the things that they tell him. And he, like I said, he was off to do some errands. He's going to pick up a quill later. But, um, for the sake of brevity, it's a it's a nice conversation, sharing drinks, all that good stuff. And before he gets up to leave, um, he smiles at her. He says, Piccolo brought me a lot of joy in my life, and I can only hope that it'll do the same to you. Maybe a bit of closure. Again, I'm really sorry to hear about your sister. Thank you, Lord Pindarek. It has been... Uh... My pleasure to get to know you. Absolutely. We'll be around town for a couple of days. Perhaps I'll run into you again. But until then, the pleasure was mine. She raises her glass as well as most of the other people at the table, and they all kind of say, Salud! And they all continue to drink. Um, and you, you, you will go about your way. Yeah, he walks away from the table with a bigger smile than he walked to it. Even having lost some of his uh, close personal belongings, he feels like definitely in a better place. Excellent. Uh, her name, if you did uh, want it, was Pavona. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, Pavona Arision. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah, and as far as errands, he just wants to pick up a new quill and make sure his fineries are uh, nice and clean for the tournament. 
Absolutely. That's about it. Let's see here. Oh no. And I don't know what keystroke it is to put the little tilde over the O, but it has one. You just have to picture it in your imagination. Um, okay. Moving right along. Let's see. Okay. At some point, Tord and Dane, the two of you are out doing something together. What is that? Uh, maybe it's picking up the last few items that uh, Sir John got so flustered that he forgot. Like, when we get back and we're going through stuff, and Tord's like, yeah, but what about this? And I'm like, uh... Sir John had to go lay down on the fainting couch for, for a little while. Composing poetry takes a lot of time and energy, okay? It's true. It's very true. <clears throat> yeah, okay. come with me. We'll, we'll get those stirrups adjusted so they fit your feet right. Can't have you falling out of the saddle on bumped stirrups. Excellent. The two of you are kind of wrapping up your errands um, when, you know, horses are coming and going, carriages are coming and going um, almost nonstop uh, through the streets. And at some point, you've just kind of gotten used to it. And when you hear the sounds of them approaching, kind of, you know, move over to the side and let them pass, you do that. And as you do so, you see one of the riders kind of pull up short after they've passed you and kind of holds the horse um, until you've kind of caught up. And a voice kind of almost hisses in your direction. Toward, you look up to see Lady Rovina Basweb, the Duchess of Lexina herself, and all the resplendent purple and black raven um, heraldry of her house. She says, well, That's the shield of House Mirth. Well, I haven't seen that in many years. It makes sense that a disgraced house should have its shield carried by such a disgraceful creature. Dane, you, I'm, there's like a, a moment where we're kind of s fixing these stirrups and your foot um, is in them and like the pressure that Tord's hand is like on your ow, leg ow, or ankle. Ow, ow, ow. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, Dane. A piece of filth sits on the throne rightfully belonging to someone else I don't think I'm familiar with that writing technique well let me teach you of its master you should watch the tongue that waggles between your tusks orc You forget you speak to a duchess, and even though you may be knighted, you are but a road knight. And it doesn't matter how, how much you pretty yourself up, you will always be the knight of flies, and nothing more. Then we have to leave right now before I do something really stupid. Why would today... Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, pardon us, Duchess. Um, apparently we have important people to go talk to. Mm -hmm. Have a good day. You as well. I didn't mean that the way it came out. I'm new at this. 
It's okay. I see the company you travel in. I understand. Yeah, what, what I meant was we have better things to do with our time. Tord, let's go. Dane, let's go. <laughs> God, get me out of here. He had telling himself to, I gotta go. You gotta get out of here, Tord. Uh, and I'll uh, get down off the horse and I'll start uh, walking the horse alongside Tord. And I'll reach around and I'll, I'll pat this horse's face and, no, no, it's okay. She scared me too. I'm gonna murder her. I'm gonna rip her face off. I'm gonna bury her six feet in the ground. Can we do that next time? We're under strict request to not do pretty much everything you just said. Meanwhile, the rider makes the sound of buzzing insects as she heals her horse and rides off down the road away. One of her riders remains behind. And she's staring at you, Dane. Uh... D- <laughs> for- forgive my, my lady, but um, Dane... Is that you? This is your aunt, Candace. Uh huh. Um. Um. Uh. Yes. You. Look at you. Yes, I um. Got taller. I should say so, and. Knighted? It's been a s- strange time. Uh, how have you been? Good. And she kind of looks after the lady riding away, trying at times, I suppose. Yes. Uh, I suppose we all travel with people who can be a little trying. Do you... Your parents know you're here? Uh, I sent, um, I sent mother a letter some months ago. Uh, not from here, from, uh, Kerwall perhaps, or, or somewhere else. Well, it's it's wonderful to see you again. Have you have you seen her? It it has been some time since I've been able uh, to to travel back to fertile ground, but uh, maybe some time soon. And uh, my father. I have seen your father uh, more recently than than that. Yes, he's. He's very busy. He travels a lot. He always did. She kind of like absentmindedly kind of reaches up and rubs the back of her neck. The, uh, the Duchess, having made her way some, some distance down the street, kind of now t- turns in her saddle and sees uh, that uh, Candace is talking to you. And she calls to her. And your aunt kind of looks at you. Oh, um, f- forgive me. I, uh, I I must go. But I, I will see you, uh, hopefully, in the tournament. I'm told I've been registered, so. She kind of smiles again, and she puts her hand out kind of on your, your hand. Your parents would be very proud of you, Dane. Thank you. And then she turns and uh, follows her lady. Tord. 
as you are kind of stalking off, you you bump into someone. You just didn't happen to see them. Maybe you weren't, uh, you know, they stepped around a corner or uh, you were just kind of out of your head for a moment. Uh, you bump into someone and he spills a, um, like a leather satchel and it hits the ground and coins kind of go everywhere. Oh, um, oh my. Looking up, you realize you recognize this man. This is Lord Farin Glenry. He's someone who has sponsored you before. He's held in pretty high regard um, for some of his public works and things of that nature, and he's very, very good with money. Oh, damn. Lord Farron. Let me help you. Todd, is that you? It is. It is me. He completely ignores the, the bag of money that spilled, and he kind of, like, throws his arms around you and embraces you. It's so wonderful to see you. You know, I was just thinking to myself how if I could go the rest of this tourney without seeing anyone else I do, I'd be a happy orc. But I was wrong. Oh. Well, I'm sorry and happy to hear that, I suppose. Uh, are you here to compete? Oh, oh, of course you are. I was just recently knighted, and I'm here to represent my lord. You are. You've been elevated from a road knight to a knight of house... Uh, and he kind of looks at your colors in the sigil. I, I don't recognize him. This is what? House Pendrake. Pendrake? Huh. It's not a house that I've heard of, but uh, they're, they're lucky to have you. That means a lot coming from you. Well, I should know. You uh, you won me quite a bit of money in that tournament. It was the least I could do for the hospitality you showed me. Undeserving, if anything. Mm, hardly. Well, um, it's very good to see you, Todd. I, I, uh, an unexpected pleasure. Certainly. Certainly for me as well. I hope I see you again. Before your departure. And I would like that. Um, perhaps so we can uh, have a drink together. Did we... I, I'm sure we picked it in already. Sure. I'm staying here. Oh. He kind of, like, seems, um, like... Uh, he's trying not to let his disappointment... Uh, show. You can tell that this is certainly a class of an establishment that would be uh, lesser than the place that he would normally frequent. But by, by no means are you obligated to come to me. Oh. I, I can I can go clean up. I can no, no, I can no, meet no. you. Uh, you you should come you should come to to the place where I'm staying. It's uh, the food is impeccable. I certainly don't mean to impose, my lord. Oh no, please, you're not imposing. It would be. It would make me happy, Tord. I insist. Well, and I would like turn to look for. I, my friend is. I'll, be okay, Tord. Go. You can bring them along. I'll do it. The house tonight. Well, I. Dana, are you sure? Yes. Go enjoy the company of your old friend. It's... They're just stirrups. I, I don't want to leave you. If you need my help. Uh, any more help and I'll have to beat you in the tournament. Very well. I would be overjoyed to eat dinner with you tonight. Wonderful. I'm happy to hear it. Very well. Um, I have some business that I must finish here, but um, tonight then. 
he toward just gives the proper um, kind of parting uh, graces. And... He uh, he bends down and kind of scoops up the satchel, um, kind of just gathering the coins that are in in the mouth of the bag and retying it to his belt. And then he kind of just looks around at the people who've kind of seen this exchange. And he looks down at the coins and he says, drinks for everyone. And he turns and he just walks away, leaving the coin in the street. Tord smirks, looks to Dane, kind of having been able to brush off the interaction with Lady uh, Basswebb for the moment. I guess not all everyone's trying to kill me. Suppose it depends on how much poison he puts in your dinner. I could only be so lucky. <laughs> well, you all heard the Lord drinks on him. Go about pick it up. Yeah, there's a there's a scramble. Like the moment after it's obvious that nobody's going to stop them. Um, yeah, they absolutely scramble for the coin. There's probably guards, like, also kind of yes, in this absolutely. small fray. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, Tord, <clears throat> does uh, Eddard know that there was a lord before him? I kind of give you, like, a, a goofy grin. Well, you see, I was never knighted into his service. I merely represented him at attorney once. It, 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 was, it was a joke, Tord. Like, like, if you had met a woman and there was another woman before that one and you'd have to... I guess I don't follow. I think that's probably <laughs> where the scene ends. Could you put his name in the chat, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Um, so that was... If I can find his name. There it is. Lord Farron Glenry. <clears throat> um, you know that he is, uh, again, a very well-to-do noble. Um, but he does not own like an estate. He doesn't hold um, a title beyond just being a, a, a lord. Um, he doesn't actually. He's not like landed uh, or anything. Um, so that's largely why he was not able to take you on as a knight. Excellent. Okay, so that was pretty much the first half of kind of what I wanted to get to, and we are just about at the point where we have been playing for two hours. So we're gonna take our break here. Five to ten minutes, go to the bathroom, refill your drinks, smoke them if you got them, kiss your spouse, etc., etc., etc. If you are going out of the house, not now, but if you are going out of the house, please wear a mask, wash your hands. If you don't have to go out of the house, stay at home. Be kind, be considerate. Stay right where you are, because we will be right back.
and we are back. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening, whether you're watching along with us live or whether you're watching in the future. Um, I hope you're enjoying what you have seen so far. This campaign is very near and dear to my heart. Um, these characters are are basically real people in my mind, and I love uh, being able to kind of discover more and more about them as we're telling this story. Um, these players all do a phenomenal job, so how about we learn a little more? So... Please, not about me. <laughs> Toward who? Um, <laughs> so, this has all kind of taken place over the day or two before the tournament actually takes place. People are kind of gathering, coming in. The The tournament fields are being set up. Um, all of the, the, the draws of who's going to be facing who have been uh, decided. There is much pomp and circumstance, um, possibly even to Ariana Shiel's chagrin. There's um, a lot of grandstanding, uh, parades coming and going with people with standards of all kinds of varieties. Uh, there is a lot of people here. Um, this is likely one of the larger tournaments that um, that you guys have ever seen before. And there is a lot of talk that has kind of been circulating, rumor that each of you have kind of picked up pieces of here and there. The first of which is that news has reached Malrich of the Bloodmouth Plague spreading in the north. And it sounds like it has spread much further than just Warrington, uh, since you guys were there last. And people are starting to, to get a little panicky. They're worried that it may spread this far down. Um, they're worried that possibly even this event, there could be someone who has brought it with them. The second thing that is becoming very clear, and you will have to forgive any parallels because these were all established <laughs> a long time ago, um, there's also a clear tension in the air, and people seem to be very divided about the the coming war between House Lathelbrin and House Mellowain. It seems like that small skirmish may not remain a small skirmish. The the kingdom seems like people are starting to to basically pick sides. Um it's starting to sound dire. Okay. Is there anything else that you are getting up to before the first day of the actual competition, or the actual events that are taking place, before we do that? Yeah, at one point in the, during the night, one of the nights, Ari will have gone off somewhere to find a pool and basically do what she's done before and send a message. Edward will also be sending a message. Uh, probably sometime after he got into um, Malrich, he will send a message to Sir Thomas Kane just to check in with him and also to let him know the situation with the, uh, the Duke Lathelburn, that he basically knows that uh, Sir Thomas is there in my stead. Okay. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, he reports back with everything is going well. Uh, there's been some some overhauling of the, um, the way things are run there, uh, and he is in the process of figuring out ways that they can redisperse 
the wealth that was gathered in the treasury. Um, try to return it to the people who so desperately need it. Perfect. Just what I like to hear. That's about it. Oh, actually, there's one more thing. I will PM you about it. It's just um, just a little thing. Show enough, show enough. That is Shogun in Harlem. All right. So, um, obviously, with a tournament going on, it stretches over probably close to a week. And there's events all day long happening, kind of scattered throughout the entire city. Um, and there's tons of knights who are competing in these different uh, events. So the way that I think I want to handle this is we're just going to go around and anybody who wants to compete in an event, just kind of describe what that event is and how your character is is doing um, in that event. And we can even roll a die if you would feel more comfortable about uh, having that determine how well you you do. Um, but if you want to leave that up to just narrative description, I'm perfectly okay with that also. Um, if you are not getting up to any like sanctioned events, then maybe you're getting up to one of the many like ancillary things that are happening, you know, throwing darts, gambling, um, whatever. Uh, so if you would, just one at a time, uh, describe one of these events, how you're doing, and um, and then I have something that I'm going to piggyback onto Eddard's. We'll save mine for last. I'll start off. Um, so there's a melee bout or tournament that goes on. And uh, Sir John absolutely goes out and he is the Knight of Lathelbrun. That is how he's entered in the lists. He is wearing armor that has been um, painted a cream color. And he's got all these red um, ribbons and things coming off like at the shoulders and on top of his helmet. His helmet visor is down the whole time. And so this Herald that we hired is coming along and like basically speaking for him the whole time. Um, but he is in the melee and he's fighting with his halberd. And this is the first time since months and maybe even years of refining his techniques on the battlefield that he's able to perform against other people in a competitive environment. And I think he fights much more unconventionally than he used to. But um, it's an extremely clever way to go about every fight as well. And he sort of used to be known for hitting really hard um, with like youthful vigor and everything. And people expected his strength to grow. And they're seeing now that instead he's become a much more tactical fighter. He's thinking about the poem Edward wrote him. Yeah, the whole time the eagle takes his prey. And yeah, I mean, I'm down to roll for that. Um, sure, either way. Yeah, I'm gonna. You guys are, are the heroes of the story, so doesn't. I'm gonna use an inspiration. As as... Sure. And roll two d twenty for this thing. So I got uh, nineteen. Yes, handily. Cool. Handily. This is not the grand melee, by the way. That's definitely the last event. Uh, but this of is, course. you know, one of many that takes place throughout the week to maybe even determine who can actually compete in the grand melee. Cool. Anyone else? If no one else is, I shall participate. <clears throat> um, I actually had a couple kind of in mind. Um, first, Tord participates in like a horse race 
kind of like the demonstration of some of the finer bred steeds from the realm. Uh, I'm sure this isn't like one of the huge events, but certainly one um, Tord would find himself at in an attempt to compete. Um, probably not to the point of victory, um, but enough to kind of invigorate his spirit for competition. Followed up with a short stint in the one of the tents kind of um, put up to show wares, um, kind of cultural items. And there's this kind of tobacco tent with all like these real ornate like carved pipes. Um, some of them might even have like uh, magical qualities of some nature or whatever. There's various kinds of uh, tobaccos in here and Tord kind of samples some of those until he maybe makes himself sick, which leads into his next event, which is an archery gig um, that he just totally blunders, um, kind of missing or having the tobacco get the better of him um, and kind of finally uh, coming up with a melee of his own, kind of looking out less for uh, another victory, just kind of gauging the competition and maybe trying to find out who Lady Base, uh, Baseweb's knight or her champion, if she's using one. Ari's been taking in the sights. Uh, this is a huge event. Um, a lot of the events aren't, you know, they're a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of foreign to her. So I think she'd be watching, you know, some of the events that Sir John had gone into and toured. Um, just maybe, um, Maybe at one point there's like a group of people uh, kind of standing around a fire somewhere, kind of singing songs and playing instruments and dancing and Ari is drawn to that and would spend some time actually just, I guess, kicking back the heels and, and joining in that kind of revelry. Um, it's been a long time since she has had the pleasure of singing and dancing with a group of people. So she would take that opportunity right now. Um, I think for, uh, for Dane, like there's a, a lot of hesitation at the beginning of anything he's involved with. And so I think that uh, like maybe like his first uh, melee is, is against other f like newly like knighted knights. Like there maybe like there's a little mini tournament just for them. And uh, you know, I, I don't think it's an, uh, it would be uh, too much of an exaggeration to say that Dane can probably handle most of those guys. Um, and so there's a bit of, uh, bravado and almost braggadociousness that comes out of, uh, out of that. And so the way that it works is you go through like this sort of like junior tourney and the top three of those new knights are then moved into the next sort of level with the, the real knights, like the actual like tourney knights. And, uh, Dane's sort of doing almost like that, that wrestling thing, right? Where he goes to the edge of like the tourney circle and he's getting the crowd to cheer and, you know, for the first time in his life and he's sort of eating it up and he turns and there is this just monster of a man. He's not tall. He's wide. He's like a, a wall and uh, just burly bearded sticking out from underneath this little pot helm. Oh, uh, and uh, his his name is Garuntius the Granite, and that's what he's known for. Is this dude just takes a pounding, and that's how he wins. 
And so as this melee begins and Dane has, you know, his, you know, sword celestial, this guy just pulls out this double sided maul. And every time Dane tries to get in to, to, you know, get some purchase, this guy is smacking him. And so we go from like this very cocky Dane to this camera shot away and out of the camera shot, you hear this, the cracking of ribs as Dane's side is engulfed with this hammer and flung to the far side of this muddied pit and he gets up and he coughs and there's a spittle of blood that we can see sort of run into this puddle and the puddle's not quite all rainwater right at this point it's sweat it's maybe it's horse urine it's water it's spilt ale and Dane's sort of coughing into it and he can see his his reflection and that reflection slightly shifts for a moment and there's this woman staring back at him and well, are we done with ourselves? And there's a sort of, you know, crestfallen look. And I think Dane looks up out into the, into the crowd and, you know, towards over talking perhaps like his Lord buddy and they're chatting. And for a moment towards not looking at Dane, Sir John is perhaps looking through the not peanut galley gallery looking for, you know, his lady and, you know, uh, Ariana shells off doing like her dancing thing. And I think he looks out and there's just Eddard who happens to be still watching this. And there's something very strange about this man who just, became a lord out of nowhere and there's been no bragging you know the, the, as the camera is seen there's this humbleness where he's given away his possessions and we can hear a slight chuckle from this puddle and Dane spits out the last little bit of blood and he, he stands back up the finery that was just bought for him this foppish nature that is unlike him is covered in Let's hope it's mud. And he squares off against this, this man that we see sort of reaches over to the crowd and he pulls away this young bread selling woman and he gives her this disgusting big kiss on her mouth before sort of tossing her back into the crowd and he chuckles and turns and we can see Dane's knuckles turn white as it wraps around this uh, this sword. And there's this that that sound that horses are supposed to make as they're traveling through muck. It's a sort of pluck, of this huge man moving at Dane, and the chuckle from the puddle turns into the sound of waves crashing against rocks. And with a sidestep and a very fast move, there is this. Eruption of energy that if you could see magic, if you could see celestial energy. And as the guy runs past, Dane darts underneath his hammer and up into the bottom of his jaw with the hilt of this sword. And mechanically, I'm blowing a level four spell slot to be able to essentially smite as a warlock um which on top of this the sword would do an additional 48 damage and so there's this crack of almost thunder and i think the crowd goes silent for a moment and then this monster this mountain just turns and ugh. and so we go through this three more times Dane's tabard becoming torn. He's bloodied. He's sore. Before finally there's that sort of uh, of this large man falling into the mud. And this very humbled and bruised and maybe not competing tomorrow because ribs are broken. Dane uh, sitting in this corner trying to breathe. And he just sort of looks up this 
like tooth that might be missing. Maybe it's just mud in his mouth, and he smiles over it at Eddard and this chuckling puddle, and he just slaps the puddle that's laughing at him. Eddard starts the cheering. There's almost instantly <clears throat> murmurs in the crowd about whether or not there was magic that just happened. So John tut tuts, of course, but quietly, not where anybody can see. I think there might even be a moment where Sir John and Tor kind of lock eyes and there's a kind of brief moment of understanding. Right. And then, of course, join in the applause because... Oh, loudest applause. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Okay, Jeremy. So you said you had something to piggyback up on what I wrote to you? Yes. Okay, so you have abstained from um, any of the direct competition, at least. And instead, you have kind of gone about running this this errand. Um, You are coming out from the shop where you have just uh, kind of paid for this this particular service. And you kind of... Um, you have to do a bit of a double take because you spot a face in the crowd that catches your attention. It was this, the eyes. It's always the eyes that, that grab your attention first. And when you look back, the face hasn't, hasn't disappeared. It's, it's still there. He's, he's standing in the crowd, staring at you from beneath this shadowed hood. And he has something in his hands. You can't quite see through the people that are standing in between you, but, but you can tell that he's cradling something in his hands in front of him. And he's just standing there, staring at you. Let me have a look at something real quick. Okay, so I can see him. He's in the he's in the stands. He's in the the crowd, kind of across the street from this shop that you've just come out of. Okay. Can I roll a perception check to see if I can figure out what he's got in his hands? You don't need to. Okay. As you kind of linger looking in that direction, you'll be able to see what it is. If, did you have something to add before I reveal what that is? Nope. Okay. So the people in front of you kind of part almost like with the the honing in of your attention. They almost instinctively just move out of the way. And you can see that his hands are covered in bright crimson. And he is holding his heart in both of his hands, extended in your direction. And as you watch, his heart and the blood that is covering it in his hands becomes black and begins to change its shape. And as it does so, it takes on the shape of a black candle with a black flame. And then he's gone. Edder just takes a moment to collect himself. Didn't seem like anybody else in the crowd noticed any of this happening, right? Okay. He just kind of closes his eyes. We'll meet again soon. 
And he makes his way back to the tournament grounds as he waits for his uh, stuff to be done. Excellent. Everybody, please take a point of inspiration for everything that you guys have gotten up to thus far. Whenever, if you guys are ready, we're about to move into the Grand Melee, the last event. So would I have been able to get my hands on what I was uh, getting up to? Absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll set that up before we uh, start then. Okay. Go for we, it. Uh, we talked a lot about lances too, so I want to get a joust in really quick before we go to the Grand Melee. Absolutely. Please. Um, Josh, you want to take care of your stuff first or? Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, Tord, as you are getting ready to participate in the Grand Melee, Eddard is with you to um, kind of make sure everything's good with you. He doesn't know a lick about the armor or, you know, the weapon. I mean, he's familiar with weapons, but he's just there for support, basically. He's helping you get your things together. And uh, he, he claps you on the back and you're walking off. And he's toward, oh God, I forgot. Um, one more thing. And what is he, it? What? he reaches into his pack and pulls out, looks like a bundle. It's like a one foot by one foot cloth square wrapped in like a, a rope and he hands it to you I I don't understand you're a good friend Torn I want you to have this is there something in the bundle oh yeah there's a little weight to it. No, there's nothing in it. Just kidding. No, there's something in it. <laughs> it's just a Psych. cloth. It's just a cloth. And when you pull the drawstring to open the bundle, uh, there is a garment inside of it. And when you unfold it, it is a snake that bites you. No, um, it is a long cloth and the more you unfold it it's uh it's a bit of like it's kind of like a mandalorian half cape for lack of a better uh better description like a boba fett half cape it is royal blue with crimson striping all the way around it he already gave you the cloak pin now he's giving you the cloak Edward, I, I'm at a loss for words. I mean, it's not as fancy as what Sir John has on, but I'm sure you understand. There is nothing that would stop me from wearing this with the utmost pride of a knight of House Pendrake. It gives you a smile. You're a good friend, Tord. And I know you'll be an even better knight. Means a lot. I mean, means a lot to you, but it means a lot to me. You pledged your honor and duty to me. You understand the weight that that carries. It means I a lot. Carry it. I carry it every day, my friend. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Tord. You know, I think I'm proud of me too. Which may sound odd, but not in the slightest, friend. Now get in there. He claps you on the back. I'll be watching. How's Pendrick? 
for House Pendrick. Okay, Sir John, you're joust. So yeah, I think this might be actually a little bit of a tag team between Sir John and Sir Dane, uh, if that's cool with you. Um, so, and it's like, it's definitely a little bit of a mentorship moment, I think. Sir John is giving some last minute advice to Sir Dane about how to tilt and like where to aim and all that stuff. Um, but in between, uh, like, in between these moments of teaching, there are these clashes and everything. Shields are splintering and people are getting unhorsed and all that stuff. Uh, and I think that Sir John does fairly well. Um, how does Sir Dane do? On a scale of like one to five, he gets unhorsed the first time. <laughs> Yeah, okay, sure. So I get you you watch me do a few of them. And every time I get off, uh, I'm like, yeah, did you see that? Did you notice where I aimed? And oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not even sure it's like the other guy that unhorses Dane. I think he tries so hard he manages to hook the tip of his lance into like the the reins and gear of the other horse and just like flips himself like <laughs> off the you horse, just done. <laughs> like even even my horse stopped and was like <laughs> so you come back and of course like you're talking to a totally anonymous knight nobody knows it's me um but you do and we're going on and on about this and then you get unhorsed and you come back over and i'm just like so dane we'll try better next time yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, turns out that Rolling barrels has nothing to do with lances. No, indeed. Uh, it does gain strength and endurance, but the exercises for the joust are somewhat different than the barrel rolling exercise. Oh, yeah. Also, no, that's I... more of a punishment. You'll learn that yourself whenever you get a squire someday. Yeah. I think I'll also show my squire where it lances. <laughs> Wouldn't hurt. You had somewhat of an accelerated training. Atypical as well. Uh, anyway, I've got to get on to my other jousts here. I wonder, do you see the Lady Laudin? What sleeves on that dress? Oh, incredible. Uh, I'm going to go take this armor off now. <laughs> Oh, come on. You'll get your wind back. And I like haul you up onto your feet and like pat you on the back and send you on your way. <laughs> Be a night, they said. Uh, it'll be fun. They said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think I want to roll again to see uh, how I turn out in this deal. I'm not going to do advantage this time. Sir John's not as strong in the joust as he is in the melee. Uh, yeah, it is 16. So I got a 17 on the die. So I think you place well, but you must not just be the one who actually comes out as champion of the joust in the end. Can't win them all. It was an honorable defeat. It, it was very close. It was down to just the two of you, we'll say. Tough. Well, I concede the victory, of course. Excellent. But was it a knight of Kerbal? Mm, who, who beat him? Mellowane, rather, not Kerwall. I actually oh. kind of like that it would be Kerwall. Like somebody from my own domain has come to compete, and I concede the victory to them. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Um, Anonymously, they don't even know. Mellowane is actually not competing in this. And the only representation of House Lathelbrin currently is, is actually you guys. 
mm-hmm. um, because they were not going to compete because of the coming conflict. Um, but yeah, there's a kind of a not an upstart, but you know, a lo- a young kind of recently landed knight um, who is probably surprised uh, if you tell him that uh, they're no longer sworn to House Mellowane, um, that instead they are now sworn to House Lathelbrin. Um, they may even have to kind of like scramble around and change uh, some of the, the, the legal paperwork um, that, that they have turned in for this tournament. Right, yeah. I think uh, I think actually there's a moment where it's like he unhorses me. Um, I get up and I concede victory to him, and then I actually take off one of my pennants and I put it on uh, this knight instead, and I take off the House Mellowane pennant and I just throw it over my shoulder. There are definitely a few whispers um, at that. Definitely. Scandal, indeed. Excellent. Okay, so are we now ready to get into the Grand Melee? Excellent. Who is competing in the Grand Melee and who is not? Dane? Tord? Sir John, I presume? Yes, okay. Edward and Aramashio, you are indeed refraining? No, I'm about to suit up and get on in there myself. Right. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. <laughs> um, if it's allowed, yeah, Ari would probably, by this time, would probably want to um, join in. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's probably not something that is where you can just walk up and say, hey, I'm just a, a person and I'm going to sign up. But since you guys signed up as a as a collective, um, you know, and uh, Sir John's Herald, um, not Herald, uh, Scribe? I don't remember what title she has. Uh, quartermaster is the one who got all the stuff. I also have a messenger in my employee, but we did hire a scribe to represent us. Right. So it was the quartermaster who probably was the one who, uh, you, uh, got everything situated for you guys whenever you got here. So she managed to make sure that you were considered in the group. Um, even if you're not a knight, technically, per se. So you can absolutely hop into the grand melee. All right, so it sounds like everyone except for Lord Pindrake. So each of you, if you would, please describe your character's first stint in the Grand Melee. Uh, There's going to be something that happens, but we're going to kind of warm things up with you guys... uh, succeeding to knock out people from this uh, this melee tournament. So I think this, I think the grand melee is the the one I don't know if this is historically accurate or not, but it's, it's the one where like at like the sides of the melee ring, instead of bringing like, you know, your chosen weapon, they have like the ones that you can continue to go back and get if you're disarmed or your shield's broken or, uh, or, or whatnot. And I think, uh, I think that the first encounter that uh, Dane has is as he sort of steps in uh, still nursing his ribs and he's very fixated on this gigantic hammer that is sitting over there and he's sort of watching for for who might be going to pick that up because that sucked um and instead i think uh that the very first person he he lays eyes on is uh what did you call them earlier uh jeremy the one the the spanish sort of influenced uh they're the gerdies um or called gerdin Gerdin. So I think I think the first thing that uh, that Dane sees is this uh, very obviously uh, Gerdin, uh, like dark hair, long pulled back uh, to this uh, braided ponytail, 
with different sort of glass beads into this this young woman, probably in her early twenties, who uh, goes over and she picks up a short sword and a and a, a mangosh, and with this sort of flare is like flipping them around as she's walking towards the group of people competing in the the grand ballet and uh, there's this weird effect as other knights are like no nah, i don't want any of that as they sort of step away from her and i think that uh i think that she and dane go toe to toe fairly well maybe she's holding back uh testing him uh for for a bit until they sort of do that that weirdness where people get snuck up on their backs and so they spin back to back to now face the other two and the pulls them away from each other as this sort of melee is, is happening. And, you know, Dane does a good job. He holds his own and, you know, eliminates a, a few people before the round's over or however it, it works. Um, but there, for, for every, like, one person Dane is taking out, this young woman is just, like, kicking and flipping and, like, throwing guys with their own weight over and out of, you know, competition. Anyone else? Tord is kind of locked in a pitch combat for probably the majority uh, of the tourney here, kind of getting lost among the, the fray away from his companions. Um, unsure of their kind of, we, we I don't know if we necessarily came up with a, a strategy here, but the, the kind of roar of combat ripples in Tord's ears, and it's all he can do to stop himself from jumping in. Um, like I said, kind of clashing with the single individual. Um, it's a a human knight, um, probably from the south. Uh, their fighting styles are similar. You can tell that maybe a human uh, influence as well as an Angorian influence is kind of crafted uh, both of our fighting styles. And as, you know, my sword bashes onto his shield and his and vice versa, the, the ring of steel kind of echoing out into the fray and cacophony of brutal combat. Um, it's kind of odd, as you see, like, all these people fighting multiple people and just the ferocity of our fight has kind of created a barrier around us as, like, the rapidity of us swinging our swords in an attempt to just batter the other down is creating, like, a, a circle uh, rate or diameter of just whirling blades and bashing shields. And it almost gets to the point where our, our swords are ringing continuously our hands numb from the just reverberations of the swords um, they're chipped just horrifically um and this man he goes for a like a high almost punch with the shield and as he he aims high toward drops low takes his legs and tackles him into the mud and kind of subdues him but before like brutalizing this man there's kind of a nod and he kind of admits defeat before taking his path off the attorney grounds Cool. So um, in a different part of the battlefield, Sir John, disguised as the Knight of Lathelbrun, uh, is sort of wading through the melee with a halberd, kind of hafting it uh, and, and fighting both with the halberd blade closer, almost like an axe, and the other end as like a, a, a parrying device and also another striking tool and a thrusting tool here and there too. Um, and he's looking out for Tord. He wants to find Tord and he wants to fight the people off his back until he can get him himself. 
Um, but he doesn't find that he's, he's going around and like, you know, knock somebody on their back and then comes around and trips a gal. She goes face first in the mud, um, has a brief exchange with another woman, uh, who like knocks him off his balance, but he doesn't quite fall. He recovers and then comes back after. Um, and then he looks over and he sees Ari nearby. And at this point, Ari has been, she was a little, maybe a little hesitant at first, not knowing really what all this was. And then watching how everything just started up and people started fighting each other. And then all of a sudden she sees this bear of a man is coming down on her and she just grabs the nearest weapon and uh, toes off with this guy. And he swings the hammer that he's picked up and Ari just kind of she bends backwards almost like an um, unnatural angle like how, how could she do this is gravity defying but the the hammer kind of just whooshes where she used to be meanwhile her foot comes up and catches the guy beneath the chin as she kind of always does this backflip um, and writes herself and before the guy can recover, she is behind him and has, I don't know if this is a lethal one, but you, uh, she has um, gone behind him and she has realized that, that she's got this tiny little mace in her hand. And that's what she clubs the guy with upside his um, helmet. And it is such a ringing blow that this man just kind of falls face first into the mud and doesn't move for a while as he is stunned and that's when Ari looks up and sees Sir John looking at her and I'm like uh, I, I'm looking at you and you can see that there are two or three people who are charging me from different directions and I only see one of them like I turn and then these other two people are coming up behind me and like they're getting close and they're about to to gang up and probably take me out of this thing and seeing that, uh, Ari hesitates not at all, and she is running towards you, Sir John, and before you know it, she is there, back to back with you. Yeah, there's like a moment where like, uh, I imagine you like fly on and grab my shoulders and swing around and kick the people or something, and then we're back to back and we're doing like the, we have the moment where we look at each other, ah, yeah. welcome warrior. <laughs> <laughs> And then we dive in and take out these people together. I love it. Maybe a, a few more come in because they think they can take us out, but they can't. <laughs> and I think at one point she dumps the mace and picks up a, a, a short sword. Something yeah. she's much more comfortable with. That's awesome. Excellent. <clears throat> um... The four of you that are involved in the melee are just fighting your hearts out and doing well. Um, several of your styles are are way more tested than these competitors. Uh, you have fought for your life before, after all, and many of these people it is apparent that they have not. Uh, that it is simply um, courtyard training, uh, though it may be considerate, uh, considerable rather. Um, it is hard to match your uh, forged in the fire uh, capabilities and experience. And uh, certainly, Ariana Shial, they are wholly unfamiliar with your style of fighting, uh, and it catches more than one of them um, off guard very quickly. Okay. The four of you are narrowing things down. Uh, the melee is uh, closing in probably probably close to half an hour. Uh, it's very exhausting at this point, but there is it's still going on. The crowd is just going uh, crazy um, for you guys. And um, if you guys... Uh, did actually enter the competition under the name Sword of Vicaril. It is being uh, picked up by the crowd and chanted um, through the majority of this, this melee. 
And that chanting for the four of you starts to shift and change and become screaming, yelling, sounds of anguish and pain. And looking around, you realize you're still in Malric, but Malric is destroyed. The buildings around you are collapsed. Bodies and rubble litter the street everywhere. The black smoke of fires that are not meant to burn choke the streets and your eyes stinging. This place is a shambles and there are people running everywhere. Narratively, we see a few knights come from just nowhere, just out of the smoke, raising their weapons against you, but are quickly dispatched. Though it's clear you are feeling as if you have been fighting for a while. You feel the exhaustion that you felt on the field just a moment before. Tord. I know you were tired of visitors. But as you, the collection of you, nodded together, stumbles into a somewhat open kind of uh, market square. Bodies, overturned wagons everywhere. You see on the wheel of one of these overturned wagons the familiar black shape of Vanwa sitting there Ah! Ah! I don't know what you want from me. All of you see Tord talking to this black bird. The bird kind of turns its beak under its wing and preens itself for just a moment. And then looks back at you, kind of tilting its head sideways so that it can look at you well with one of its eyes. This is the future that has not yet passed. Tord. Tord. This, this is the future that may yet be. How could I change it? What can I do? The sword. The sword must be reforged. Ah! We're trying. Reforge the sword. Unite Vicaril. Unite Vicaril. It then takes flight, and Vanwa swoops upwards. You said that Ariana Shiel, John, and Dane are around me? Yes. Did you see that? You seen it? What fey devilry was that? I don't know. It seemed to know you. And I'm, I'm trying to find out what it is. Is the world around us still this hellish scene? It is. Yes. <clears throat> 
Is it telling the truth about this future? All of you notice movement kind of at the fringes of the market square, kind of between the buildings. You see a group of what looks like peasant, um, mainly women, that seem to be gathering up the weapons of the dead and collecting them kind of in their the crooks of their arms like bundles of firewood. They all seem to be kind of helping one another do this and as somebody as one of these these women gathers a bundle she turns and kind of walks in a specific direction every single one of these women that gets an armful of weapons like this turns and walks in the same exact direction what is this future that may come to pass. No, I heard the bird, but... That's a lot of swords. Are they being taken to be reforged? Swords gonna follow them? I don't know. I don't know what's required of us in this quest. I know the steps, but the pathway is... Obscured. Anybody who is uh, giving these these peasant women more attention may roll a religion check if they would like. Four, eight. <laughs> oh, 15 okay so Dane <clears throat> um, you are the only one who recognizes or maybe it's you're the only one who sees but as one of these um, these women kind of turns in your direction you can see that she appears to have been weeping though her tears are black and you can see that her eyes burn with this dull firelight. And that reminds you of a story that you have been told, that you read once before or heard once before. These women are known as the Wives of Woe. They are servants of Thorn, the god of war. They are collecting the fallen warriors' weapons so that their souls may be claimed by the god of war and they may be put to rest. They're all dead. Each, each of those swords is someone who's died this isn't this isn't a war this is a massacre this this is what happens at the end of a war and looking around I think we lost there's anything we can do to not have this happen if this is a future that's not happened yet we must how is a bird showing us the future I think Ari just looks at you how does a woman in water give you powers has some long time ago she was 
a suitor for one of the gods when he took the form of a knight. And the evening he... It, look, it just... it. I'm not trying to make light of a situation, but I put all of my eggs in the what the fuck basket when I woke up in a cauldron in an oven. I don't know, but I don't think this is good magic or bad magic. But that's just it. It doesn't even feel like magic. I don't. I don't feel this at all. From just down the road, in the direction that these wives of woe have been carrying their bundles, you hear the whinny of a horse, but it's it's distorted. It's lower than it should be. It's slower than it should be. And you hear its hooves coming up the cobblestones and a shape emerges from the smoke its rider is someone that most of you probably every one of you except maybe for Ariana Shial sees a a being who is known as the avatar of Thorn The name that he goes by is the Warmonger. He rides an Angorian steed that has red eyes, and smoke pours from his nostrils and mouth as if it was a cold morning constantly. Birds circle above his head. Hey there. Hold on, Steve. What's up? <laughs> you're muted. Or you're unmuted, rather. You got it. Okay. And birds circle above his his head constantly. His armor is imposing yet it shows only superficial damage. He rides slowly forward until his steed stops in front of you with barely even a, a nudge on the reins. The weight of his, his form creaks in the leather of the saddle as he turns and looks down at all of you. The visor of his helmet, empty and pitch black, comes to settle on you, Tord. And he reaches to the other side of his horse and draws a sword with the and he hands it to you, Tord. You recognize this blade. This blade is the sword that you picked up from the Weeping Knight. He hands it to you Hilt first. And he says a single word. Sakawida. He turns the reins on his horse and makes his way down the street. The moment he does that, the buildings around you erupt with activity as you see a multitude, many copies of the Weeping Night begin to pour from them and charge your group. What are you saying and doing in this moment, you four?
anybody? I think Tord um, is trying to get his back to one of his companions um, and kind of maybe reaching behind him to pull them closer to him. Words escaping him. So John steps forward, and whereas before he's been kind of hafting his halberd, like I said, um, when he steps forward, his halberd actually precedes him, and he steps beside uh, Tord and sort of like starts a very basic shield wall sort of formation. We've faced these evils before. We will do it again. I'm with you. I'm with you all. Now and forever. Ari nods grimly as she looks upon what's coming down and readies her blade. Tord, what did you do with the sword that you were handed? I'm using it now. <laughs> I have it in my hand right now. Excellent. This, this group of weeping knights presses in from all angles. You can feel the twinge just behind your jaw of the moment right before a battle that you aren't certain you can win. Tord, you raise your blade as one of these knights approaches you and you bring it down with such ferocity. And as you do so, the four of you are back on the pitch field. Mowridge is fine. The crowd around you holds their breath, watching the end of this grand melee. Toward. You stand across from the Bossweb House champion. A knight by the name of Sir Bullard Kennet. A smug individual. You have brought this sword down so hard. The sword you are wielding is in fact the sword of the Weeping Knight. You've brought this sword down so hard that you have cleft his longsword in half with a resounding ting. Your weapon sings loudly, carried throughout the tournament. The crowd erupts into a roar, and the chant goes up of Swordbreaker. You look around you, you realize the only people left standing in the arena are the four of you. So, what are you going to do? I think in light of this vision that we've just received, um, Sir John kind of looks to the other three each in turn uh, and my, my visor is still down so you can't see me, uh, but I'm looking at the other three and I am clearly hesitating to attack. Would we be like loud enough to address the crowd at all? You're pretty sure that if you start talking, this crowd's going to listen to you. I'm going to look over at Sir John and then to Dane and Ariana Shiel. I am very proud to have made it this far 
among such great knights. And I look to the field and see some of the best. But there is something that must be settled here, even between friends. Sir Dane, Oriana Shiel, do you mind if Sir John, or I would say the Knight of Lathorin, the Knight of Lathorin, and I have to finish. Thanks. Silently, Ari would just kind of, um, she would bow like you have done uh, throughout this time to other people that you respect. It's probably the first time you've ever seen her bow. And she drops the sword and walks out of the room. <clears throat> so I think Dane sheathes his sword and walks over to, to Tord. He stands in front of him and he reaches up, adjusts and tightens some of the fittings in your armor. And then in a, in a low voice, he leans in a bit toward, you have to beat him. If he's champion, he will do something that is brave and meaningful to him but it will destroy him when he finds out the results and then I turn and go over to uh, Sir John and I again adjust some armor she's in a stand She's listening. She's watching. Remove your helmet. And fight for what you believe in. Um, Sir John uh, puts his hand on the top of his helmet, but only to settle it more securely. And then he puts his hand on Dane's shoulder. Uh, it's very much like a fraternal sort of grasp with this gauntleted fist. Oh. I tried. And uh, I'll walk out. So only two remain standing upon this this pitched field, this arena. Tord, Sir, Sir Tord of House Pendrake and Sir John of House Lightnor. I know you both have a shit ton of hit points. So, instead of having this be a normal battle of attrition... I think we're going to have this come down to one single roll. If both of you are all right with that. Uh, Baron, I cannot see you nod because you, your camera is frozen, but I can hear you. So if you'll give. That sounds good to me. If you could just nod louder. <laughs> nod, with, nod with noise. Use noise. Use your noises. <laughs> so whenever you gentlemen are ready, uh, I will take those rolls from you. One each. Go ahead and add your uh, whatever your normal melee attack bonus is. Okay, so like, can I use a superiority die? Superiority die here? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, cool. Uh, That's then, the likewise. case. Baron, you get a whisper in your ear. <laughs> I believe in you, Tord. Oh. <laughs> you get a yes. D eight inspiration die. <laughs> I was worried. He said superiority bad. I said no. <laughs> <laughs> I think his superiority today is a ten, but still. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm getting something, and I'm happy about it. <laughs> uh, okay. 
cool. if both yeah, of you I mean, would like, you can send them to me um, privately through the chat here. If you would okay. feel more comfortable doing that than calling it out. Yeah, Thanks. definitely. Trust um, me, it works to send it to Jeremy. Did you see <laughs> with me and Ariana Shield? Yeah. <laughs> this one's for all the beans. <sighs> I'm nervous. No pressure. Just everybody watching. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Just the entire tournament on the shoulders. Yeah, just, of this, oh, this and, and, the and also the fact that the Grand Melee said death. Oops. <laughs> Oopsie. Yeah, everybody else is fine. Just the last two guys got to fight to the death. Right. Yeah, everyone else can leave. You two, kill each other. I'm also really concerned with the amount of typing that Baron that just did lot. for like, his dice roll. <laughs> He's, it's a really big number. Well, I, I wanted... There's lots of commas there. Yeah, this is the Banders version for reflections. Everything up to this was actually a flashback. We're going to kill each other right now. <laughs> Game over. End scene. Actually, that'd be a cool reflections game to play if we survive all this. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> That's how we need to go rivalry. I'd that'd watch that. That'd be fun. We might have to arrange that. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So, Tord, you fight hard. You fight valiantly. With a twenty-seven total, you give Sir John a run for his money. However, Sir John, with a 34, is going to triumph over you in this. So, Tord, what does it look at, like as you, you get Sir John onto his back footing? And then, Sir John, what does it look like as you pull this out and win? It's a duel of technique um, over brute force and maybe uncharacteristic of Tord. He is using almost formal steps that he's attempted to pick up for Sir John. And perhaps that is what gets Sir John on an off foot, where usually Sir John imagined Tord would swing high and hard he kind of faints and swings towards his midsection, having Sir John kind of um, almost lunge backwards, jump out of the way. Um, but I'll leave it to Eli to finish me off. Yeah, all right. So um, you're, you're making a valiant effort. You're driving me back. And we're flashing back to similar moments that we saw in the fight in Warrenton uh, for that young elf boy's life. And it's going similarly. You're really starting to overpower me. You're getting me like almost to the point where I fall over. Um, I, it seems like I'm going to stumble for a moment, but then I dig my heel in and I become like just a bulwark that you're crashing against for a little while and I don't back up anymore. And then um, I start to move my halberd in ways that like not even you have seen me use. Uh, it's, it's happening, it's, it's clearly stuff that I trained in secret and had observed, not just from the foes that we face, but specifically from you, watching you in, these, all, these, in all these fights must be how I uncovered these techniques here. And I start um, like every inch that you drove me back and put me on my back footing, I make you lose your footing an equal amount back. And so like by the end of it, um, I've almost tripped you. And then I think I uh, have my halberd. I have it in a place where it's down low and I could bring it up like right into your armpit if I wanted to and like basically cut your arm off, uh, but I twist the halberd and instead I slap your hands with the uh, blunt side of it, with just like the flat edge of it. And uh, the impact, it like comes up around your hands and slaps you from the top and you actually just like completely drop your sword, uh, at which point my halberd comes up to your neck and I lead you down to your knees for uh, the final concession. 
I think there's a moment as I'm kind of down in front of you. And this would just be audible between you and I. You can fulfill your oath, you know, right now. You've said it once, you'll kill me one day. It is not this day, friend. And then I extend a hand to help you up. And in, it's the, the it's like classic warriors clenching of forearms. Um, and like a, a mighty pull pulls me to my feet. Um, and the entire arena erupts. Um, people are on their feet and screaming at the top of their lungs, chanting the name Lathalbrin over and over again. And you also hear Sword of Vicaril, the sword, over and over again. Sword Breaker. There's just a, this massive um, display of noise and joy. And that is where we're going to end our session. So, um, I don't know, it sounded like maybe you couldn't see the, uh, the pictures and such, Baron, but um, I'm going to share the image of uh, the sword that you were handed. Just for everybody who wants to see. I will uh, also put it in our chat uh, so that you can see it as well. Yeah, so like an hour and a half ago I lost all video and have just been like tethered to the hope that I don't lose audio for whatever reason. It's, your audio has been good uh, this whole time. Uh, we get changes of your visual every once okay. in a while, but it, it comes, <laughs> it changes and then freezes. Yeah, I, but, I don't know what's going on. Hey, man, it's the internet. I, I got to stay, and yeah. that's all I care about. Because right. more often than not, I just be like, no, oh, you're done. No, I'm glad that it held out uh, through the rest of the game. Hey, um, so are we still broadcasting? Yep. Can I sting her with uh, a declaration to Lady Laudine really quick? Oh, please do. Okay, cool. So like uh, the crowd is erupting and then I throw off my helmet and cast it to the ground. uh, And I hold my hands out for silence and I um, start to stroll across the melee grounds to the like noble box. And I pull out the kerchief from my wrist, uh, from my sleeve. And uh, everybody can see like, whoa, that's not Lathalbrin. That's that's from House Lightenor. What's going on? Um, And I hold up the favor and I say, this victory is in the name of House Lathalbrin. Long may they serve our queen. And this... Victory is also hereby bequeathed and given unto the Lady Laudine of Astawin. If love were so bountiful in gifting me with joy as I am to it in having a firm and sincere heart, I wouldn't mind to run my weary days. My love so high that hope lifts and steadies me, and when I ponder how her value is overwhelming, much I love that I dared just to want her. Since now I know that my heart and my feelings will make me do, as is their use, a bountiful conquest. This bountiful conquest is in your name, lady. And then I kneel. The, uh, the crowd, like, holds their breath, like, while Sir John goes on with this, this poem. And Lady Laudine is... Uh, She's she's pretty much squirming in her chair, um, and you can see that she is, though maybe embarrassed with being put on the spot, that uh, she is using her the sleeves that you described earlier to cover the lower portion of her face because she is beaming. Fantastic. Ooh, scandal, girl. <laughs> I know. The gossip rags are going to be all over this mm-hmm. one. Front page tomorrow. Um, 
So, yes, that was awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was a, a wonderful session. I love um, the ones where we get, uh, we get the time and the capability to kind of hit on multiple people's uh, little threads and kind of pull those a little bit. Um, and that was certainly what we managed to do in tonight's session, as well as have a tournament, which is something I know that everybody has been kind of wanting since the, the inception of the game. So hopefully it paid off in spades. I am very happy with this uh, with this session. I want to say, uh, before I do that, I'm going to throw it over to you guys so that you can plug what you would like, um, things of that nature. If anybody does mention a... Um, like YouTube channel or um, in Josh's case um, his Twitch channel you should be able to find the link to that in the description of this video below and I would consider it a personal favor if you would go and check out each and every one of them give them some love some likes some subs all that good stuff so uh, we're gonna do this in reverse order from what we did before and Steve we're gonna go with you first so uh, as always awesome session um, as I was saying in one of the chats earlier, it's nice to have those sessions where it's uh, not always just drama and toward in an oven. Um, so, you know, the, the laughing uh, is good, but, you know, it's it's so great because it's it really becomes the players laughing at the situation at these like other real life individuals are finding themselves and right. Like we, we get to enjoy those moments as an audience for ourselves as well. Um, awesome session. I, I loved it. Uh, definitely in my, my favorites uh, so far. The only thing I'm going to plug is uh, come back to this channel technically tomorrow now. Right. Because it's for me, it's midnight. Um, and uh, yeah, Sunder Hearth. Um, the next session of, uh, of Sunder Hearth where we'll talk about magic, um, but really religion. Uh, so, and that will put us at our halfway mark, right? At session six, I believe. So, you know, halfway through a year of doing that, that's awesome. Uh, definitely uh, check that out. And uh, yeah, that's what, that's what I got for right now. So, yay. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Yes, please do come back Sunday um, evening, I believe at 7.30. No, I think we pushed it back. I don't know. It'll be up there. Check it out. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to uh, dive back in. It's a really fun world-building project that's been going on, and it's hard to believe that we're already halfway there. Um, but I'm excited. I want to run games in that setting very much. All right, next up we have Josh. Man, it's a good thing I just came up because my internet just, like, crashed uh, right at the middle of what Steve was saying. And then it came back right on, as you said, it was my turn to close my turn. Anyways, my name is Josh. Again, tonight I played Edward Bainton Pendrake. Uh, man, what a delight of a 20th session. Uh, like Steve was saying in the chat, it is nice to get those moments of uh, lightheartedness. But even with the lighthearted overall tone of the session there was still some heartfelt moments and some tension between some of the characters i don't know who but i mean it was pretty tense for there for a second um thank y'all so much for coming and bringing y'all a game every time i know it's not hard for y'all y'all are just naturally good uh jeremy again thanks for getting all this together it's been a pleasure so far and i can't wait to see where else this goes thanks everybody for watching i appreciate you all I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is... I have two campaigns um, that I run online um, concurrently right now, and both of them have such such fantastic inter-party chemistry. The characters are so well-defined in the way that their relationships have been built over the course of what we've done um, makes playing them just so much fun. Um, I'm surprised by a lot of the outcomes that the choices that you guys make, um, but every single step feels right for the story that is kind of unfolding for these characters, and it's just it's just awesome to uh, to kind of watch that happen organically. So thank you guys for uh, for coming along and, and being on this kind of weird, crazy journey and putting up with uh, the shit that I throw at you. Next up is uh, let's go with Karen. 
all I can say is keep throwing it because it's amazing <laughs> to be on this end and having to react. Um, this was an amazing session. I really liked how we got to show other sides of their characters as well and the bonds that they're creating and maybe breaking and things that are going on. <laughs> but I don't know what he's talking about with that. Um, these players are like, they're my family. So I, I love this campaign. It is, uh, yeah, it's it's awesome. And having this as the 20th session, that was just so much fun. So I cannot wait to see what happens next. Because <laughs> there's going to be a scandal, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no blowback whatsoever. <laughs> never. Ever. Never is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to, to dive into all the, the juicy stuff that you guys gave me this session. <laughs> all right. Next up, we have Eli. Hey, everybody. I'm Eli. I was playing Sir John. That was a delight. Um, I remember whenever we first started this game, Jeremy sent out a questionnaire about our characters to kind of give us uh, some direction to go in. And... <laughs> One of the questions is something like, what is a monster that haunts you? <laughs> and it was Lady Laudine. She haunts my dreams. I can't stop forgetting about her. I can't stop thinking about her. Uh, she makes me lose sleep. And here we are, face to face. It feels good. <laughs> it was real good. So yeah, that was a blast. Um, in, other word, in other news, you know, life goes on. Uh, things are still in incredible motion right now. Keep pushing for change. Black lives matter today. They mattered yesterday and they're going to matter tomorrow too. So uh, pay attention to them and join their struggle. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Here, here. <clears throat> Thank you for touching on that, by the way. Yeah, Black lives matter and we all can do better. We need to be doing better by each other. It's the only way we're going to get through this crazy shit show that's going on currently in this country and hopefully build a better word, world for our children because I know I want to do that for my kid. Okay, uh, last but most certainly not least, uh, with the man with the frozen face, Baron. Uh, despite my lack of video, I am as ever present. Uh, once again, thank you for running this. Thank you guys for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, as our 20th century, 20 sessions ago, I actually, maybe it was 19 sessions ago, I got into a fight and it was close, but I won and it sparked a rivalry that had reached a new level today. And I'm pretty fucking pumped about that. Um, it's intense to see how this game is almost two years later. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> kind of echoing what Eli has said. Uh, there's a lot of bigotry and racism that is completely unnecessary and being a white male, it is my obligation to utilize privilege that I have to use my voice to show support where it's needed. And Black Lives Matter. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. Excellent. Also very important words. Thank you, sir. Um, that's all we got, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in, whether you watched along with us live this evening or whether you may be tuning in in the future. Be sure to come back because there is going to be plenty more to this campaign if this is where you started. There's plenty to go back and watch prior to this, uh, to watch where and how we got to the point that we are. Um, if you enjoyed what you saw tonight, hit the like button, subscribe if you'd like. I do appreciate that very, very much from the bottom of my heart. And until next time, your dice roll high and your snacks always be within reach.